Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone to our final uh, class on uh, Bayt al Maqdis, uh, concise history of the Holy Land step by step Bayt al Maqdis. Jazakumullah uh, khair for uh, attending and being on time. And uh, this is our final uh, class. And inshallah, as a follow up, there will be a one year uh, diploma program if anyone would like to. Uh, participate in that and the details of that will be uh, circulated inshallah and inshallah before the end of the uh, lecture if you remind me inshallah I will share uh, more information uh, on that um, our discussion today will be the current occupation of the Holy Land and its roots uh, what we have been discussing in the last uh, few weeks has been uh, the um, <coughs> uh, history of Beit al-Maqdis from the uh, beginning and we have went through from 10,000 years ago and how the history of Beit al-Maqdis developed uh, and within the uh, uh, Quranic timeline that the Quran has given on the history of uh, this particular land that the Quran discusses more than any other land uh, in the uh, in the world and the significance it does uh, have. Last week we have discussed the Crusades, uh, and the week before we discussed uh, the connection of the Sahaba with uh, with Beit al Maqdis, and uh, we got to the Crusade and we saw how for centuries Beit al Maqdis was um, uh, a hub for the first time after the Muslim have. Uh, controlled this land. It was a place or of uh, where multicultural, multi-religious society prospered, and uh, an Islamic vision of inclusiveness, which we have discussed. And even with the Crusades that have taken place, and how Salah uh, al-Din was still faithful to the Muslim vision that he didn't see Bayt al-Maqdis uh, exclusively Muslim, but a place open for uh, everyone. We discussed how the response to the crusade and the example of Imam al-Harawi, Imam al-Sulami, and other uh, scholars who have were putting the main uh, foundation for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis, and that gives us uh, an importance, an important uh, uh, roadmap for the future. And we saw how Nur al-Din Zinki and before him his father Imad al-Din and later on, uh, uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi have managed to liberate uh, this land. Uh, we asked you uh, to read an article, uh, and uh, the attendance form is on the screen. And for those who join later for the session, there will be a separate attendance form with questions from the sessions. So questions uh, to make sure that you have attended the session. Uh, and based on that, inshallah, you will be able to get the certificate at the end of the course. And also remind me to mention to you the assignment that each one has to uh, submit uh, a short assignment. Uh, I will discuss it at the end of the uh, session, inshallah. Uh, 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 the article talked about the uh, how the crusader mentality has continued and even after the liberation of Salah al-Din to Al-Masjid al-Aqsa and to Bayt al-Maqdis uh, the kings of Europe came on the third, of three, third crusade uh, from Germany, from France and from England uh, and they uh, tried to take Bayt al-Maqdis back and uh, Salah al-Din managed to defend it however Bayt al-Maqdis was lost twice during the reign of his nephews uh, the uh, the brother of Salah al-Din al-Adil, his uh, son, uh, unfortunately, uh, handed over Bayt al-Maqdis to Frederick uh, the, set, this is the second, who uh, controlled Bayt al-Maqdis for 10 years. And however, he, uh, living with Muslims in Sicily, he was uh, trying to be uh, apply the uh, inclusive uh, idea of Islam because part of the uh, agreement that Al-Aqsa Mosque will be in Muslim hands. 
So this was not uh, touched. And even during his visit to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, he saw a priest with uh, a cross and uh, he got angry with him and he had a bottle of wine and he threw him out of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, later on, after uh, that period, Al-Aqsa and Bayt al-Maqdis were lost again and turned back, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa was turned back to uh, uh, a church uh, for a short period before the last Ayyubi uh, king managed to, uh, Sultan managed to regain it back once and uh, for centuries it stayed in Muslim hands under the, uh, later on the Mamluks for 250 years and then the Ottomans for 400 years until its occupation. However, however every century there was an attempt to reoccupy Beit al -Maqdis. and something that happened with the third crusade, Richard the Lionheart, as he was leaving the Holy Land, he said that actually the key to Beit al -Maqdis is actually the um, uh, Egypt. So occupying Egypt was extremely important uh, for the crusade and it became the focus of future crusades like we see in the seventh crusade where the target was Egypt and then North Africa through Tunisia and North Africa to try to take Beit al -Maqdis back. There was many attempts over the centuries to take Beit al -Maqdis back and the article details all of these uh, examples. Alone in the 13th century, there was on the 12th, 13th century, more than 35 attempts to try to take back the Holy Land from the Muslims. Uh, and it was during the Mamluks that managed to completely eradicate, uh, eradicate the uh, crusader presence in the uh, in the region but something quite interesting that happened is uh, and I, I suggest that you read the articles of Carol uh, Denley who uh, discusses the uh, Columbus uh, Christopher Columbus and his quest for Jerusalem and she has an article and a book on the subject uh, where it was the main focal point of Christopher Columbus, and also in the article it details some of this, uh, for him going west actually was in order to reach the Holy Land and take it back from the Muslims. And this is recorded in his own words, in his memoirs, where he discusses that the money that the gold he's raising from the Americas will be able to raise uh, an army uh, to take the Holy Land back from the Muslims. And he was in touch at that time. It was the Spanish Inquisition uh, and the uh, occupation of Al Andalus, uh, or what they call the Reconquista, uh, taking back Al Andalus back from the Muslims and through, throwing Muslims out. And uh, this, uh, both Frederick and uh, Ferdinando, sorry, and Isabella uh, were also part of this uh, scheme. And when Christopher Columbus died, all his money, uh, he left uh, his will to be used for the reoccupation of Beit al uh, However, this was the rise of uh, Protestantism uh, in, uh, in, in, in the West. And this took a different approach. And also, at the same time, we're talking about the uh, uh, rise of the Ottomans and the Ottomans were at the uh, gates of Europe and went further all the way to Vienna. So the Crusades now were directed to stop the Muslim uh, uh, coming into Europe uh, from, for, from the East uh, and this uh, saw uh, a shift. And with the rise of uh, Protestantism and particularly the Puritans, uh, the discussion of the New Jerusalem. Uh, and this becomes today actually something part of the uh, creed of Christian Zionists who would like to, in order, e even this was uh, in the mind of Christopher Columbus, he was talking about the end of the world, happening within a particular year and that the, the, the return of the Messiah and this later on becomes a focal point of uh, evangelicalism and particularly uh, Christian Zionists who uh, well before Jewish Zionism uh, were 
pushing the idea that the Jews need to be taken to Palestine for the uh, return of the Messiah. Uh, but in between, we have the French Revolution and uh, Napoleon, uh, who comes and occupies Egypt in 1798. 1798, he comes to uh, the Holy Land, to Beit al-Maqdis, to Akka, and while he was there, he issues a proclamation in which he invites the Jews of Asia and Africa to gather, to gather under his flag in order to re-establish the ancient Jerusalem and to, uh, uh, to uh, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad, uh, to rebuild the temple for them. Uh, although he was secular, he was using religion. Napoleon was a very uh, clever uh, individual and he uh, pushed uh, when he was in Egypt. He uh, claimed that he has uh, he's a Muslim and his name is Ali uh, Ponaparte. Uh, so he says, "I'm what makes me different from the Ottomans? They are not Arabs, uh, and I can rule you in the name of Islam." Uh, and when he gets to the Holy Land, he tries to win the Jews over, and he does this. He plays with religion. Uh, the way uh, uh, he wishes in order to achieve uh, his uh, political uh, political uh, gains. The Jews were not respondent to his uh, uh, proclamation, although even later on he continued to push this idea forward with Jews in Europe. Uh, this was uh, uh, not very successful. Uh, however, uh, he pushed he tried to push this idea, but it was the British that took this idea forward and took the uh, religious dimension, particularly with uh, Protestant evangelical Christians in uh, in uh, uh, the uh, in, in in the UK to try to push this idea forward. Napoleon was defeated by Jazar Ahmed Ali uh, Pasha uh, at the shores of Acre. Uh, where before him Richard the Lionheart and even French uh, monarchs and other European kings were also uh, uh, there. Uh, from that place he uh, is defeated and goes back to Egypt and then heads back to Europe. But uh, uh, Christian Zionists pushed this idea forward and I will come back to them. But immediately after that uh, the Ottoman governor Muhammad uh, Ali Basha of Egypt rebels against the Ottomans and he uh, occupies uh, Bilad al Sham, uh, all of historical Syria, including Palestine. And he, together with his son Ibrahim Pasha, uh, they, uh, in the short period, in the 10 years that they ruled Beit al Maqdis, made massive changes in the Holy Land. And, uh, uh, Kawalun Mehmed Ali uh, Pasha, um, uh, for the first time in the uh, uh, in, in 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 the city, uh, Western consulates, uh, particularly starting with the British, uh, and the British because the French had claim over the Catholics, uh, the Russians over the Orthodox, and the British had no uh, way of penetrating. Uh, the uh, Holy Land, so they claimed protection of religious groups and they took protection of the Jews as something that they uh, did. Uh, although this goes back further back in history from the 17th century, but the actual changes took place during the time of uh, 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 Mehmed uh, Ali, uh, Kawala Mehmed Ali Pasha, uh, who uh, did this during his time, and this is starting from uh, going back to the early 1800s. As I told you, the British took on board some of the ideas that were being pushed, and they started now pushing these ideas uh, forward uh, with the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. Uh, was established in the early, early uh, 1800s, and the aim of this was to convert Jews to Christianity and to send them to Palestine. This uh, project failed, 
because not many Jews actually accepted uh, Christianity. So the, the project then moved towards moving the Jews toward uh, Beit and Mahdis. And one of uh, uh, those uh, uh, who uh, converted uh, to Christianity was a Jewish uh, uh, rabbi. He becomes the bishop in Jerusalem. And uh, he says only when the Egyptian forces under uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha and under Ibrahim Pasha, his son, first entered the par pa Palestine, the permanent Protestant mission in Jerusalem proper could first be founded in 1833. There was no Protestant churches in this city and he allowed the building of this. Not only that, he allowed the building of uh, more than uh, nine synagogues in the city. Uh, Jewish prayer at the Al Barakh wall, uh, the western wall of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, previous to this time, was not something that uh, was uh, a norm. It becomes that, and even during the time of Ibrahim Pasha, there was suggestion to buy this from the Muslims, and the Muslims refused this. The establishment of the first foreign consulate in the city was the British consulate, and John Farron uh, and Palmerston was at that time the foreign minister in uh, England, uh, and uh, together with uh, many people, uh, the uh, Campbell, who was the High Commissioner in Egypt, because now Egypt was under the British, uh, and uh, uh, more, and others. There was lots of discussions in the early 1830s, and eventually it was Christian Zionists, um, namely Shaftesbury, who was part of this Christian Zionist groups, uh, who he was the son-in-law of Palmerston. So through the uh, mother and daughter uh, relationship and the intimate relationship with Palmerston, he was also a lord in the uh, House of Lords. He was actually anti-Semitic, and this is quite interesting. Uh, he was against the relation of the uh, Jews in the UK. The Jews were not allowed to vote, and Shaftesbury was against Jews having the right to vote in the UK. At the same time, he was pushing this idea forward that they need, they need to uh, they need to be moved to Palestine. And Palmerston lobbied the uh, Ottomans to allow this uh, uh, and to reform the Ottomans uh, in, 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 in that time. The idea that developed during this period, during the time of, uh, there was lots of different schemes for the uh, occupation of uh, Palestine, uh, lots of European schemes, uh, and you will see the details of them in the uh, paper. Uh, and the ideas that were being pushed forward were that Palestine needs to become uh, a separate entity under some European power and lots of the different European powers. So it was not to return to the Ottomans, it was to become uh, a sort of semi-independent uh, state under uh, some European uh, power. Eventually it returned to the Ottomans uh, and uh, the Ottomans, uh, when they returned in the 1840s, they were uh, faced with all these different uh, uh, consulates that they had to now we become de facto, they could not uh, close them. And this was part of the uh, allowing the Ottomans to take Beitul Maqdis back. And many uh, people were not happy with the Ottomans going back particularly some European powers, because they had different plans, even having it as a, a Christian um, kingdom and to try to re-establish uh, that. However, under the Ottomans, uh, for 400 years, for 300 years prior to that, uh, Christians and Jews uh, were living under what we call the millet system, which they were allowed to administer their own internal affairs within the frame of Islamic. Uh, Sharia. So the Christians had their courts, the Jews had their courts, and uh, they uh, uh, would 
go back uh, the high court, the high Islamic court, uh, if there is something that uh, was undecided in these courts, it would go back to the Islamic court. So uh, the Ottoman archive shows us, and some of the Jewish uh, academics have done extensive work on the Ottoman archive, and it shows what? It shows actually that the uh, Jewish women would go to the Jewish court, and if the rabbi would not give them their right, they would threaten them to go to the Islamic court to get their Jewish rights. This is how inclusive the Ottomans uh, were. Uh, Jewish prayer, prayer at the Barak wall uh, happened at the end of the uh, the end of the Ottoman uh, period, um, particularly after the time of Muhammad Ali uh, Pasha. Uh, and the turning point, uh, which we will be discussing is the end of the Ottoman rule, the start of the British occupation, or what they call the British mandate, Jordanian rule, and the Zionist uh, occupation. Um, during the, uh, a very important point in the history is uh, the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid, and we will come uh, back uh, to, to this. But this, uh, what started with the, what started with the, um, uh, French Revolution and the rise of nationalism uh, was to have a major effect on the region. Uh, the French Revolution and the idea of nation states were now uh, being presented to the Muslims and to different uh, groups as their uh, future. And uh, this uh, invisible uh, carrot, this uh, uh, thing that was being presented to them becomes the thing that Muslims today, unfortunately, live and die for. Uh, for states that were drawn on a map by colonial powers, and they have to uh, accept, uh, accept uh, many of this. Uh, and we will come back to this important uh, point uh, again. Uh, as we see, uh, foreign interest in Beit al Maqdis has never stopped since the Crusade, and it continued throughout the centuries, but now it has shifted, and Beit al Maqdis is now the focus, uh, particularly, and we see this uh, throughout the centuries from Columbus to the 17th, 18th, and now into the 19th uh, century, and we see that uh, the Crusade is now taking a new dimension and a new uh, position uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. Uh, and we, we see this with the, uh, with the British uh, establishing their consulate. And the role of the consul was the protection of the Jews, although there was no direct connection between the British and the Jews, but the, in order to create this, an English consular agent in Jerusalem, as Palmerston says, uh, becomes a necessity. Um, and uh, Muhammad Ali Basha uh, and the, the different instructions that were done in order to uh, procure a fairman from the Sultan on this uh, on this uh, issue um, and we see this that the idea was uh, to develop now uh, a buffer state uh, that uh, the aim of which will be to control the heart of the uh, Muslim uh, course uh, and the British were constantly pushing this uh, through their uh, ambassador or consul in uh, Istanbul to try to push some of these ideas uh, forward. This concept of a Jewish buffer state we see in the uh, work of, uh, uh, in the writings of Shaftesbury uh, in the 1830s, the end of the 1830s, and he appeals to Palmerston, uh, who later becomes the Prime Minister of England, that the, the idea of an anglicized Jewish colony in Palestine, strongly sympathetic to British interests, 
and dependent on British aid uh, and under its protection, obviously, uh, grew appeal uh, in appeal as a result of subsequent historical development. Some people were pushing this in Britain as a religious matter uh, in order for the second coming of the Messiah, and others were pushing this idea as something else, as in British interest, in order to control the uh, trade routes with India. So you see this being pushed, and you see this in the British media in the 1800s, being pushed in these two directions. One appealing to politicians and politics, and the second appealing to uh, uh, appealing to the religious uh, dimension. And the idea of a Jewish client state to the British, so the Jews were to be used as a pawn uh, in the hands of the British. And this is very dangerous. And if you see today, actually, what is happening uh, is um, the, the, the Jews are used for Western interests. And you see this being reiterated by Netanyahu and uh, even other prime ministers, that they are an outpost of Western democracy and the West in that uh, region. But you see this in the quotations that you see here in front of you, uh, particularly the Crimean War, which started between great powers in the 1850s. Uh, the reason for this was fighting over religious, uh, uh, religious rights in uh, Jerusalem, uh, and this, uh, the, the British, uh, sorry, the Ottomans were trying to play both the French and the Russians in this, and this uh, caused the start of the Crimean Wars because of what was happening in Beitel Noctis in Jerusalem, uh, and uh, this becomes uh, a, a very important uh, milestone in the history of the city and the region. Uh, uh, as Clayton uh, puts it, uh, was to ensure a British presence in a strategically vital area. Uh, so now using the Jews uh, in Palestine and the Jews that will be moved to Palestine will uh, ensure a, a British presence in that uh, area, while the others were pushing off the idea of a Jewish client state that would constitute a key link uh, in Middle Eastern uh, chain. And the term Middle East is very problematic, as we have discussed in our first uh, class. Um, but as many academics have argued in this, uh, it was also for colonial interests in India. A Jewish client state in Palestine was increasingly seen as a vital, uh, vital to British colonial interest, particularly in India and particularly the trade uh, routes. Uh, uh, Thomas Clark in 1860s, uh, in, 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 in a book uh, written, India and Palestine, or the restoration of the Jews viewed in relation to the nearest route to India. So all of this was now being pushed in that uh, dimension. Uh, the Jerusalem question, internationalization, inter of Jerusalem as a project was now being pushed by a lot of these uh, powers uh, from the early 1830s uh, and allowing, pushing the idea of allowing non-Ottoman citizens to own land uh, with a political uh, drive for religious and cultural uh, dimensions. And what we see here emerging, this was by the British consul in Damascus, uh, Charles Henry Churchill, who wrote to Moses Haim, who was the Jewish leader uh, in the UK, and pushing him. And the Jews were not interested in this idea, but he was really pushing that you need to push this idea forward and unite the Jews around this idea of a Jewish national home. And the Jews until now were not buying into this idea. This is in the 1840s, in the 1860s, 50s, and even 70s. And it took until the 1890s, until the Jews started, Jewish nationalism started to develop out of, uh, out of this. 
uh, but the British government were pushing the Ottomans, uh, and we see this in a letter from Palmerston to uh, the ambassador's ambassador in Istanbul to push, lobby the Ottomans to allow Jews to come to Palestine and the creation of something under the Ottomans. So not independent from the Ottomans, uh, uh, this is what was being pushed forward, but in reality, it was to be under British uh, control. Now we come to the rise of Jewish nationalism and what became Jewish uh, Zionism. And what you see is a hundred years before, uh, uh, before uh, uh, Jewish nationalism or Jewish Zionism, we have Christian Zionism pushing these ideas uh, forward in all these different uh, circles amongst the Jews and the Jews were not that interested in this, uh, in this uh, issue until, uh, uh, until Theodore Herzl comes into uh, the scene. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> with uh, Theodore Hertz, um, who uh, establishes the uh, first Jewish uh, Zionist Congress or the Zionist Congress uh, in Basel in 1870, in 1897. So you can see we've discussed 100 years of Christian Zionism, and now 100 years later, we have, and even before that, the suggestion of uh, Napoleon uh, following the uh, French Revolution, uh, pushing this idea forward, and the Jews were not interested. Actually, the Jews were quite happy living under the Ottomans. The Ottomans were uh, gave, gave them a safe haven when the Jews were thrown out of Spain and uh, were being persecuted, and they were welcomed in Ottoman lands, across the whole of Ottoman lands. And the majority of them, settled in different areas. They could have settled in Beit al Maqdis in Palestine, in Jerusalem, but they decided not to. Very few of them actually settled there. They were not interested in this idea. This idea was not something in Jewish mind until Jewish nationalism started with, uh, before Theodore Herzl it did start. However, it did not, uh, uh, the fruits of it, uh, were only seen during the uh, time of the time of uh, Theodore Herzl, who uh, started uh, uh, gathering the Jews around this idea of creating a home for the uh, Jews. Uh, and he was not; he was secular, and he was not interested in Palestine per se. Uh, so there were suggestions to have. Uh, in Uganda, to have a Jewish state in Uganda, or uh, in uh, Americas, or in the Southern Americas, or in different places. Uh, and they were happy with these suggestions, but the Jews would not, the whole, the, the Jews would not uh, gather around this idea unless they managed to get uh, something that has a connection with them, which has, which was uh, Palestine. So using Palestine was something uh, that would uh, use religion and gather the Jews around this uh, this idea. Uh, Herzl met with Sultan Abdul Hamid, who went to Istanbul, he tried to meet with him many times, and he suggested the idea. And after long discussions and after the different schemes, eventually the offer that was offered to the Ottoman state, which was uh, in debt, uh, millions uh, in debt, uh, suggestion was to consolidate the Ottoman debt in exchange for a charter allowing Zionists and Jews to ac access to Palestine and also uh, uh, giving a massive bribe to the Ottoman Khalif, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid. And the response of Sultan Abdul Hamid was rejecting this idea and his statement on this is very very clear uh, that this land does not belong to him it belongs to all the muslims and this land was uh, uh, not to be uh, given up uh, and over 
his dead body. Uh, so he was very adamant on this, and we'll come to his last letter in which he explains that he was dethroned because of Beit al-Maqdis, because of the Holy Land, because of not giving, giving Palestine as a, a land for uh, the Jews and to the Zionists. In this, we see the British coming on board with three different schemes, and the British were very uh, cunning. The British made three promises, promising Palestine thrice, uh, and uh, we have the Balfour Declaration, we have the Hussein MacMahon and uh, the promise to Sharif Hussein, and we have the Saiz Pico uh, Agreement. So Palestine was being offered to three different uh, people uh, at the uh, same uh, the same uh, time, and what we see uh, uh, with uh, now the British are manipulating the concept of nationalism. They managed to succeed with the Jews, and now they are succeeding with the Arabs. Uh, Sharif Hussein, who was the Ottoman governor of Hijaz. Uh, Mecca and Medina, uh, and who lived actually for a long time in Istanbul uh, and uh, under Sultan Abdul Hamid. And when Sultan Abdul Hamid was dethroned and the uh, project of uh, Islamic unity, of bringing all the Muslims under one banner, which Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, lived for, the concept of Ittihad al Islam, uh, uniting the Muslims, and uh, he would appoint the mufti of uh, British Muslims and he would be uh, following uh, the news of the Muslims in Indonesia, in Thailand, across the whole of the Muslim world. When he was building the Hejaz railway, money was coming from across. This was a project of Muslims. Money was coming across from India, from across the whole of the Muslim uh, world for this uh, particular uh, project as uh, as uh, as we have uh, seen. Uh, now coming back to uh, the British, the British managed to uh, actually, and also the French was just not not the British uh, Turkish nationalism and uh, Arab nationalism actually started in uh, France. Uh, the first meeting of uh, the young Turks and the young Arabs. Uh, was taking place uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in France, in Paris, uh, in Paris, and uh, returning to Damascus and pushing this idea forward. The son of uh, Sharif Hussein, Faisal, uh, became part of uh, the Arab nationalist movement, and he suggests to the British that we will uh, fight alongside you. This is in 1913, 1914. We will fight alongside you if you uh, help us create an Arab kingdom. And at that time, the French, uh, the British High Commissioner in Egypt, he said, we are not interested in this offer at the moment. And when the Ottomans entered World War I, uh, the British then took this uh, project forward and uh, engaged with his father, Sharif Hussein, suggesting to him, and this is a cabinet document stating that Palestine would be included, included in the pledge uh, by the British to uh, the Arabs. Uh, and you can see the map here to the left, uh, the whole of Arabia, uh, what was being uh, discussed in this uh, letter is quite uh, interesting. Uh, and you can see, uh, if I zoom in, the memorandum to the British uh, commitments to uh, Hussein and uh, talking about Palestine and the Waqf and the holy places and so on. And you can see in the uh, map uh, most of Syria, except for the northern part and the western part where Lebanon is, but Palestine was definitely included in the uh, uh, commitment of the British to uh, King Hussein. So Palestine is offered here to uh, Sharif Hussein that this will be part of his uh, kingdom. 
what was not being discussed is uh, Lebanon and northern uh, uh, Syria. The Brit this was in, uh, let's go back, see the date uh, on this. This was uh, starting from 1914 till 1917, the discussions uh, in, in this. At the same time, the British and the French had uh, uh, an agreement. Actually, the, the Russians and others were part uh, of this agreement initially, and uh, later on it was just uh, that it became known as the sykes picot Agreement. Uh, Mark uh, Sykes and George Picot, uh, the French and the uh, the French and the uh, British were dividing the cake. Uh, and you see here A, B, um, and Palestine was to be left under international administration. So Palestine is going to be under international administration. And they, you can see the uh, map uh, showing this. And this is uh, uh, the uh, grave of uh, uh, Sykes, uh, and you can see what is interesting is that he's being represented as a crusader, and you can see if we zoom in here that underneath his feet you have the uh, Muslim uh, Ottomans, and this is still the way this these pictures were taken by uh, the late um, uh, Mohsen Jack Kilby. Uh, who uh, last uh, two years ago passed away. He was one of the founders of Islamic Jerusalem uh, studies. He accepted Islam together at the same time with Yusuf Islam, and he was his photographer uh, as uh, a singer before they both become uh, Muslim. And you can see here in the image uh, the Muslims being crushed underneath his uh, feet, and you can see the depiction of this crusader uh, mentality still living on. You can see it even on the image uh, here uh, to, the, uh, to the right, together with the sword and the crosses uh, uh, over, uh, over it. So that was uh, the second promise, to divide the land. So the first was to give it to Sheikh uh, Hussein and the Arabs. The second is to make it into, into international, uh, under international administration between the French and the uh, British. And you can see it here, not all of Palestine uh, and the, the boundaries of Palestine were not set until uh, after that. And the third uh, was the Balfour uh, Declaration. And you see the Balfour Declaration uh, was issued in 1917 offering Palestine to be uh, a home for the Jewish people. What is interesting is, until now, Jews have not bought into the idea. And the only Jew uh, in the cabinet, in the British cabinet, uh, Edwin uh, Monte, uh, believed that the Balfour Declaration was anti-Semitic. Uh, and it, it provided an excuse for European uh, countries, including Britain, Britain, to pack their Jewish citizens off to Palestine. Um, so this is how it was seen, and he was adamantly against it. And the uh, Balfour Declaration had to be rewritten a few times uh, um, uh, for this uh, to uh, to to to. Uh, to be uh, uh, presented uh, in the name of the Foreign Office uh, by uh, Balfour. But this was not just a British thing. Six months earlier to that, the French also promised Palestine to the Jews. And before Balfour Declaration was issued, uh, other European countries and even the United States and the President of the United States were in support of this, including the Pope and the Italian uh, government. So it's quite interesting that the Balfour Declaration was not just uh, 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 was not just a British thing, but it was 
something that was uh, presented and there was consensus on it across the uh, board. Although it is uh, uh, the text of the letters uh, quite short, uh, however, you, you read uh, His Majesty's government after considering the aims uh, of the Zionist organizations, and these are the drafts, accepts in principle to recognizing Palestine. Uh, and this was given uh, to the head of the Zionists in the United Kingdom. Uh, but you can see here in the text, in the drafts, Palestine as a national home of the Jewish people and the right uh, of Jewish people to build up its national life in Palestine under the protection to be established uh, at the conclusion of the peace following the uh, successful issue of the war. His Majesty's government regards essential for the realization of the principles to, gra to grant of internal autonomy to Jewish nationality uh, in Palestine, freedom of immigration for Jews, and the establishment of a national colonizing cooperation for the resettlement of economic development in the country. The conditions and the forms uh, are, uh, you can see, and the draft, you can see in the draft that you see here, His Majesty government accepts in principle uh, that uh, it becomes the national home of the Jewish people. This is a, another a draft, uh, endeavors to uh, secure the achievement of this objective and will discuss the necessary method uh, and means with the Zionist organization. Finally, this was the final text uh, from the Foreign Office on the 2nd of November, 1917. Uh, uh, Balfour writes, uh, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government. Uh, it was for a long time until the death, the death of the Queen. It was uh, Her, Her, Majesty, Her Majesty's government, but now it is back to His Majesty's government. The following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspiration, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. He, these are the exact words that were finally presented his majesty's government's views, uh, 119 words, with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And be, um, pushing this by, the, uh, uh, by Edwin uh, Mon Mon Montag, uh, that uh, the uh, other religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine does not mean Christians or Muslims, non-Jewish, uh, shall be uh, observed or uh, protected. Uh, you can see how this playing with the concept of nationalism in people's minds, putting this idea of a nation state in the minds of the Arabs, in the minds of the Turks, in the minds of the Jews, now this is to be achieved and the British are able to uh, divide the Muslim world, split it up uh, uh, together with the French and others, split up uh, uh, the unity that united the Muslims across the board with borders that were drawn in blood, uh, not just over the sand, but uh, in, in, in blood. The British uh, uh, issuing the Balfour Declaration in November were already in preparation for the occupation of Palestine in December. They pushed through Egypt and the, Muslim, the, 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 the army of the British was supported on the right hand side by Sharif Hussein and his son Faisal. Uh, and in the British army occupying and Beit al this you can see uh, not just uh, British, the British were, uh, yes, they were the uh, commanders, but you can see Indian Muslims uh, and Indian soldiers and French soldiers uh, are uh, part of the army that occupied the uh, land. And you can see here what is quite interesting is the way this memory of the crusade was being uh, re, uh, 
uh, brought around it. You can see here uh, from the Australian War uh, Memorial, you can see uh, how uh, a soldier uh, is shaking the hand of a crusader, uh, and you'll see this uh, across the uh, board. Um, Christians and Jews in Islamic Jerusalem and Beit al Maqdis, as I mentioned, were living under uh, Islamic law. Uh, uh, conflicts amongst Christian communities uh, over holy places were to be resolved by uh, the Ottomans. Uh, the keys of the church, the status quo was uh, to be maintained. And this word, the status quo, is today important in the uh, occupation uh, of the uh, Beit al Maqdis and the future of Al Masjid Al Aqsa uh, and Mubarak. Uh, Muslims took care of the Jews and the Christians and treated them justly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if a Jewish woman did not get her right from a Jewish rabbi, then she will uh, take him uh, to um, a Muslim. High court, uh, so immediately he would adopt a more flexible position on financial and personal uh, matters. And the British occupation of Egypt and uh, led to the first Jewish waves uh, of immigration or migration into Palestine in the late 1800s. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, we see this uh, becoming now. Uh, a fact, and with the British occupation and the Balfour Declaration, this has become uh, becoming uh, more uh, possible uh, in that. The British occupation, and it's not just a mandate, they call it the British mandate, uh, was initially a military administration uh, under the name of uh, the Western Administration of Occupied Enemies Land. Uh, meaning the Ottomans here, uh, in uh, July 1920, a civil administration repla replaced the military administration. And just before we come to that, let's just look at the image uh, here with Allenby coming in the city and declaring the end of the crusade. Uh, he declares that this is the end of the crusade. So you can see, although the British tried to push the British government, said we should not use crusader rhetoric because this we have in the army, we have Muslims, uh, Egyptians and uh, Indians and also uh, the Arabs. We should not use such rhetoric. However, Allenby in his uh, occupation uh, speech actually announced uh, announced this to be uh, the case. Uh, in 1920, when it became uh, a civil administration, the first administration was led, the first high commissioner was a Jew and a Zionist, uh, a British Jew and a Zionist, Herbert Samuel. And he uh, created different laws that uh, and regulations uh, uh, that uh, allowed uh, for a stronger Zionist and British uh, presence in that. Hayim Wiseman uh, came and visited uh, uh, Samuel and uh, uh, in his speech, uh, Wise, uh, Samuel actually organized a meeting uh, between uh, Wiseman and Arab nationalist leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, during Samuel's time, uh, the architect of Alexandria came to Jerusalem and restructured the city and divided the city into four different areas. The walled city, uh, areas around the walled city, no building was allowed. The eastern uh, Jerusalem, so now we have a division of Jerusalem uh, into eastern and western Jerusalem, uh, building with rest restrictions. And Western Jerusalem was a developed area uh, and allowed building, and this becomes the hub of Jews in the uh, in the city. Excuse me. 
the British established a new constitution for Palestine, mandate uh, uh, established um, by and accepted by the League of Nations at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, and it included uh, part of the uh, Balfour Declaration uh, allowing uh, Jews in that. The British occupation of Palestine is the worst of the occupation. This is the start of the real Nakba of the occupation of Palestine, uh, uh, appointing a Zionist, a Jew, to be the first high commissioner. Uh, he used to support the Jews politically through uh, giving them lots of political and administrative power, uh, raising number of Jewish employees in the administration, the British administration, creating uh, many Jewish Zionist uh, organizations, such as the Jewish uh, Agency, uh, supported them militarily by overseeing the establishment of military units, such as the Haganah, which becomes later on a threat to the uh, British, uh, and uh, later on becomes the uh, Israeli occupation uh, forces, or what they call the IDF. Uh, uh, the numbers of Jews started to increase uh, during the British occupation from 8.3% in 1919 to 31% in May 1948. So you can see the rise in Jews in Palestine and the many factors that uh, have led to this, including the Holocaust in, uh, in, in Europe, and that was the, uh, and uh, many, many documents have shown even Zionists in alliance with Hitler uh, to move the Jews to, uh, uh, to uh, Palestine. Uh, however, during the, the, this British uh, occupation, uh, right from the beginning, uh, land was given also free of charge for, uh, uh, for uh, Zionists, 200 thousand or 300,000 square meters of fertile land was given free of charge to Zionists uh, on the coastal area. And then another 200,000 was given with minimal rent to the British, uh, giving them half a million dunum of land, uh, 500,000 square meters uh, to start uh, uh, creating what they call the kibbutz and, and, and so on. Uh, although what happened initially, uh, and this is a problem in nationalism, is, and let me go back to a picture that is very disturbing. Uh, you see the image here, uh, and you can see some of the Muslims are clapping, uh, welcoming, Allenby as he comes into the city. You might tell me the Muslims were happy, unfortunately, yes. Uh, and they welcomed them with open arms. You might say this is impossible. How is that? How can that be possible? When we talked in the first lesson, in the first seminar, of the occupation of the mind, the occupation of the mind is way worse than the occupation of the land. You start thinking, and this is at the time when Arab nationalism was a speak, also uh, Turkish nationalism, uh, before the occupation of the British, uh, the Turks had already, uh, after the uh, dethroning of Sultan Abdul Hamid, who uh, lost his throne because of the Timakdis, he says in a letter he writes to his sheikh, uh, Abu Shama that the reason that he was dethroned is he would not give uh, Palestine as a Jewish homeland. He, he writes this clearly. And the uh, Turkish nationalists, Ittihad and Taraki, and the young Turks take over, and they allow Jewish migration immediately into Palestine. Not only that, they uh, Turkify, everything becomes... Uh, Terrified, even the governor in Jerusalem would not be able to communicate with the people because he would not be able to communicate with them, like at the Sultan Abdul Hamid's time in their language in Arabic. Now everything has to become in Turkish, and this created 
uh, descendant against the uh, Turks. Uh, and this is why uh, the people saw the British as their savior. And if I would read you some of the uh, very disturbing events that took place at that time with the Mufti of Jerusalem uh, coming to welcome Alimbi, not only that, but when he hears uh, of the crusade in his speech, he walks out and he's upset, but then he comes back to Alimbi and welcomes him and congratulates him on the occupation of Palestine and the complete occupation of that land. Not only this, uh, as I told you, Samuel managed to get meetings with the Zionists and the Zionists explained that we're not here to take your land, we're here to live together and so on and so forth. And the Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, Hajj Kamil al Hussein, uh, puts the foundation stone together with one of the priests of the city uh, of the Hebrew University. This is the occupation of the mind. This is, uh, uh, you have scholars coming, uh, not local people, but even um, uh, scholars coming and uh, writing poetry, even saying the entry of Allenby into the city will be very disturbed by a scholar from an Azhar. Uh, he says, that the entry of Allenby into the city is only compar comparable to the entry of Omar ibn al-Khattab. This is how low uh, Muslim scholars at that time were going. The occupation of the mind was the worst. Uh, when you think, as one of the authors at that time says, the enemy becomes your friend and your brother becomes your enemy. And uh, you read this in the works of Lawrence uh, of Arabia um, uh, and the spy, the British spy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. For the last few days, of, I think I've had the cold. My apologies. Um, uh, and seeing this, and uh, that your enemy becomes your uh, savior and your brothers uh, become your enemy. And Lawrence says that we need to re revert uh, Hajj from going to Mecca to go to Damascus, from going from the ideal of religion to the ideal of uh, uh, this uh, nation, uh, state, or nationality, uh, or nationalism, sorry, nationalism. And they succeeded, unfortunately, in buying over many of these uh, Arabs uh, to their side. Uh, and not all the Arabs, by the way, because the majority of the Arabs were still fighting alongside the Ottomans. And the uh, British would fly over Ottoman camps and throw letters from Sharif Hussein and from the British saying that they're coming here to save them from Ottoman oppression, from Turkish occupation, and they're coming here to re-establish everything. And this is why people unfortunately welcome them, clapping and welcoming them into the uh, city the way they have uh, done. Uh, what happened after that is when people started waking up from being this in the state of drunkenness uh, and their mind occupied. And when they saw the, Brit the British were not coming here, and you see actually a similarity of this to uh, the occupation of Iraq, when Iraqis were welcoming uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Western occupiers, the Americans and the British, and the others occupying their land and clapping. All these uh, uh, Iraqis are now crying blood uh, because of the democracy that the, the West brought to two million dead Iraqis. Two million Iraqis were killed in the process of bringing them so-called uh, democracy. Something happened uh, similar a hundred years ago 
uh, in a very uh, different, uh, in, in a very similar uh, light, unfortunately. Uh, when people started, actually, this started immediately, uh, people were going to the British camp, uh, army camps, giving them gifts and so on. But the British were after, the British soldiers were after two things. And when people started seeing this, they started getting disgusted by the, uh, the British uh, soldiers. They wanted uh, booze, alcohol, and they wanted women. And uh, people were upset with this and they were not happy with this. Uh, and this was being provided to them by uh, the uh, Zionists and the uh, Jews uh, for them. And you, there was a, a a documentary or a series on Channel 4 in the UK that covered uh, the promised land, I think it was called, and it covered parts of this, how uh, Jews and Zionists were working against the uh, British uh, in, uh, in this. Uh, the start of the uprising, including the younger brother of the Mufti, Hajj Amin Husseini, who later becomes a Mufti, but before he becomes a Mufti, actually, he, uh, unfortunately, he uh, is uh, buying into this Arab nationalism idea. Uh, he recruits thousands of people uh, to fight alongside the British, uh, the destruction of the Hijaz air, uh, railways and other things are, are uh, many of the things and the British saw him as a friend until he uh, becomes the Mufti and he sees the British and what they're doing and then he starts leading some of the revolutions against the, the British however he was still uh, close to them in a way or another but in the early 1920s uh, there was clashes against uh, the occupation uh, the British occupation where uh, four Muslims were killed, uh, nine Jews were killed, and the British tried to prevent the Arabs from leaving their homes and uh, issue the curfew and uh, stop many of the uh, newspapers. Then Al Masjid al Aqsa becomes the focus of this. This was at Nabi Musa in the month of April, but then Al Masjid al Aqsa and Al Buraq wall becomes the focal of the uh, conflict. Uh, Jews come to Al Burak wall and start saying the wall is ours, uh, and uh, they talk, start talking about the temple. And this in August 1929, uh, when they tried to take over Al Burak wall, uh, the next day was the anniversary of the Mawlid al Nabi. The Muslims, after the Friday prayers, go down to Al Burak wall and have a ma massive demonstration, and then starts. Uh, clashing uh, with them, with uh, with them, and the British side by the side of the Jews, and hundreds are killed in the uh, in the uh, process. Uh, uh, the uh, ag agreement that was taken that no negotiations, no contract, uh, and asking for the dissolution of the mandate. However. And the one that was leading the revolution, the Islamic dimension of it, was Sheikh Azadine Qassam. And Sheikh Azadine Qassam, he was actually from Syria uh, after the new divisions of the new identities, but he did not see Palestine as separate from his land. He fought against the, the French in Syria and then decided that the Masjid al Aqsa and Bayt al Maqdis is the focal. If we lose it, then we lose everything. So he continues. Uh, against the Zionists and the British and Sheikh Azadine al-Qassam as the Imam of uh, the Haifa uh, Istiqlal Mosque uh, fights and leads the uh, revolution and his killing, uh, his martyrdom uh, in 1936 uh, starts the 1936 uh, revolution. Actually, what is interesting, he was against uh, the Palestinian elite who were pushing for the idea of uh, negotiating with the British to try to gain our rights. And he said, you cannot negotiate with them. There was an earthquake that took place in the city, in the holy city, that caused a lot of damage to Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. If you were in the position 
let me see, hear your ideas. There is an earthquake, damage to Al Masjid Al Aqsa takes place. Which is a priority to fight the occupation and the Zionist plans and the colonialist uh, British plans, or to renovate Al Masjid Al Aqsa and to restore it? What would you, uh, what would you uh, have done? Uh, until uh, I see your answers, I'll drink another glass of water. Okay, uh, getting some answers. Uh, Mahmoud or Muhammad Wahid says fight the occupation. Uh, okay, uh, fight the occupation. Zainab is also saying. Uh, the question was, would you fight? Now there is an earthquake in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. This happened in the 1920s. Fight the occupation. Uh, with that money or spend the money on um, restoring the uh, damaged Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Uh, Mushtaq says renovate, and this was the opinion of Haj Amin al Husseini to renovate Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Uh, Ismail uh, Baba, uh, this was the opinion of Sheikh Azadim al Qassam uh, and Farha Farheen. And the others continue fighting, fight the occupation. This was the opinion of Sheikh Azadim Qassam. We have to fight the occupation. Not uh, uh, what uh, you're suggesting to do both. Sheikh Azadim Qassam said, what would benefit us in beautifying the mosque, restoring the mosque, if we would lose the land? Uh, uh, this money, instead of being used for uh, renovating the mosque, we should use this money for fighting uh, and liberating uh, this land. Uh, you cannot do both. This is what Sheikh Azadim Qassam was trying to do. Haj Amin al was saying otherwise. He was saying, no, we need to raise the money, restore the mosque. And he started asking different Muslim rulers to send money uh, for the restoration of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Alan B suggested to him, and he said to him, Listen, I will put an advert in the Times newspaper in London and I will raise this money within a few days for you. Hajj Amin Hussein said, No, this money needs to come uh, from the Muslims, so thank you for your offer, but no, thank you. Uh, the money eventually came from. Um, uh, from uh, different rulers that were supported by the British, particularly Abdullah, the son of Sharif Hussein. By the way, Sharif Hussein, when he started asking for uh, what the British uh, uh, had uh, offered him uh, before during the uh, discussion, they said to him, he said, we need to re-establish the Khilafah. And I, I, I spent a week in the British archive and I got uh, physically sick at reading the letters between Sharif Hussein and uh, and even seeing the original size peak of map and so on. Uh, but one of the letters, they said, the Turks are not the legitimate Khalifs because Khilafah should be in Quraysh and you are the rightful owner of the Khilafah. You come from the garden of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or coming, or the one coming from the blessed tree of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have the right to be the Khalif. And they bring the text that I read is shocking. It was written by a faqih, someone who understands uh, Islamic fiqh very well. And it says from the first Khalif, Abu Bakr Siddiq, all the way to the last Abbas al Khalif, all of them were from Quraysh, all of them were Arabs, and the Islamic ruling is that the Khalifa needs to be an Arab, and these Turks are not legitimate Khalif, and you should be the Khalif. When he starts asking for the Khilafa, they expel him, and they, uh, what is the worst is what happens next. If someone spits in the face of your father, would you still shake hands with that person and sit with them? That's exactly what the sons of Sharif Hussein did. They continued to deal with the occupation, with the British, uh, and the British had appointed 
by their side, uh, uh, advisors, not advisors, actually, they're the ones setting the ground. All of you have heard of um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, but uh, above his payroll was a woman. She was the one that created most of the identities today in the uh, Muslim world. Uh, this woman, her name was Gertrude Bell, if you have not heard of her. A uh, Hollywood film was done about her life called uh, The Queen of the Desert. Uh, it portrays her as an incredible woman. Uh, but she, Faisal, the son of Hussein, would not take a decision without her permission. She was, uh, she was the maker of kings. Uh, and you see at the uh, crowning of many of these kings, her presence is there and she stayed by their side and uh, she continued to do this. But coming back uh, sh uh, to uh, the renovation of al Masjid al-Aqsa, Allenby suggested that he raise the money and Sheikh Hussein, uh, not Sheikh Hussein, Hajj Amin Hussein said, no, the money needs to come from the Muslims. And the money eventually came, majority of the money came from uh, Abdullah, the son of Sheikh Hussein, who all of his budget actually comes from the British. So the British paid for the renovation of Al Masjid uh, Al Aqsa uh, in uh, a twisted, uh, a twisted way. Uh, what happens next is uh, the revolution uh, takes place uh, in 1936, and uh, there is a general strike. Everyone is standing against the British and the British need to end this general strike. How would they end it? They would use their Arab puppets, the Arab leaders to do this. They use the Saudis, they use the uh, King of Jordan. Uh, he was not even the King of Jordan. He was the Emir of Jordan uh, because it was uh, by when Churchill together with uh, Gertrude Bell and in their presence was also uh, Lawrence of Arabia yeah. in 1921 they met in Egypt and with one signature uh, uh, Churchill creates a new identity a new state and he calls it uh, the Emirate of Eastern Jordan uh, and uh, that becomes later on becomes the kingdom of the Hashemite kingdom of uh, Jordan but it was decided and you see the map of Jordan today has been drawn with a ruler. Uh, this is, uh, and you create the identity and people live for this identity. And this is the identity we know, unfortunately, uh, today. Uh, uh, there is lots to discuss here and I'm skipping a lot. And please keep your questions until the end uh, where we will uh, deal uh, with them because I cannot read the questions as we are going along because there's a lot to cover until the modern uh, period uh, today. Uh, the Arab leaders intervene and they say, we are uh, going to make sure that the British hold their word and please end the general strike. And we will make sure that the British will keep their word. Obviously, uh, the, unfortunately, the general strike ended uh, with the intervention of the uh, Saudis and other Arab leaders, and eventually uh, what happens next, uh, you see how it uh, unfolded, uh, particularly after World War II, the rise of Jewish immigration into Palestine uh, went very strong, but now we come to 1948 and 1947, and how did the occupation of Beit al-Maqdis and Palestine take place? Now, today, the boundaries of Palestine or mandate Palestine is the British Palestine. So when we see this map uh, that we will look at now, uh, uh, what happens is the uh, destruction of 530 villages and cities took, takes place in, uh, uh, in uh, 1947 to 1940. Uh, nine, uh, and you can see here in the map that you can see here uh, the way that these cities were ethnically cleansed. Military assaults over 270 
localities, 51% of what later becomes Israel uh, was ethnically cleansed at gunpoint. So two out of the 530 villages and cities, 270 of them were evicted. You can see the maps and the map in front of you. The blue dots are the ones evicted by that. 23%, uh, uh, 122 localities were expelled by Jewish forces. So they would go in and expel the population. Uh, people, 9%, on the fall of neighboring localities, uh, fearing for their lives, they uh, escape to nearby places waiting to uh, go back, psychological warfare, 50 localities that were going to come and murder your women, children, and kill everything like they did in Deir Yassin. And the Israeli archive recently <coughs> exposed many of these uh, places that were actually uh, through military assaults and massacres have taken uh, place. 1% uh, or less, five localities, uh, the Arab uh, uh, generals who were to be liberating Palestine under whose command? Under the command of a British general. His name was Glob Basha. Uh, and on the ground, the general uh, that was uh, leading uh, the defense or so-called defense, whose name was Norman Shaw, another British uh, general. Uh, so they were the ones, uh, they asked five localities to withdraw uh, and they will return them uh, back, and some we uh, are unaware uh, of. And you can read more on this in the works of uh, Salman Abu Sitta and Benny uh, uh, Morris. So you can see 83% uh, actually were ethnically cleansed directly by killing and forcing people out of their uh, places. So you can see how things evolved uh, and how 80%, uh, 78% of British Palestine was now under occupation uh, through these different uh, means, starting with the occupation in 1917 till 1947 to 48, and how all this land was occupied and how it moves beyond that. Uh, the British uh, argument and the Zionist argument that was being pushed forward at the beginning is that this was a land without a people, for a people without a land. This goes back to, to Christian Zionists in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, Lord Shaftesbury saying a country without a nation is in need of a nation without a country. Is there such a thing to be sure that there is the ancient and rightful lords of the soil, the Jews? Uh, and even in the early 20th century, Palestine is a country without a people, and the Jews are a people without a country. And when they came to Palestine, this propaganda was used to get the Jews into Palestine. And when they came, uh, now uh, there are people here. So now there is a country which happens to be called Palestine, a country without a people. Our intention is to finally establish such a society in Palestine that Palestine shall be as Jewish as England is English or America is American. Uh, and you know what that actually means. America is not really American uh, because also the people there were ethnically uh, cleansed. This is said in the early uh, 1900s and 1930s by the chairman of the Jewish National Fund. Haim Wiseman says, if there are other inhabitants there, they must be transferred to some other place. So now when they move the people there, now there are others living in this area. We must take over the land. We must have greater and nobler ideal than preserving several hundred thousand of Arab fallahin, Arab villagers. This is what was being uh, happening. Uh, this is how the Nakba in 1948 uh, took place. Uh, cities like Yaffa, uh, other places, you can see uh, uh, in 1948, uh, the population, 70,000 70, Palestinians, 30,000 Jews, 19 schools, uh, over uh, 11,000 students, 12 mosques, 10 churches, 4 hospitals, and 7 daily newspapers. This is from 1946. 
And you can see how two thirds of Palestine, uh, which was rural, uh, people living in villages, most of them were expelled out of their uh, villages and uh, ethnically cleansed. Uh, and there is a lot. Uh, this is uh, an extract from uh, the text of Plan D uh, directly. This is the order to the uh, Zionist uh, soldiers and militias. In the conquest of villages in your area, you will determine whether to cleanse or destroy them in consultation with your Arab affair advisor. And you are permitted to restrict in so, in, in, in so far as you are able cleansing, conquest, and destruction operation of enemy villages in your area. It was very clear, the text of the ethnic uh, cleansing, as we have shown how uh, most of this was 78% uh, of Palestine was, or British Palestine, was ethnically uh, cleansed. Uh, the second step was to prevent the return of Palestinians uh, to their uh, villages because uh, Arab armies uh, were meant to preserve what was then the uh, United Nations uh, 1947 partition plan, which 45% will be to the Palestinians and uh, uh, 55 to the Jews, which was rejected by the Jews and the Arabs. However, uh, what was left for the Arabs was just over 20% uh, and the rest uh, taken by the Zionists. And in 1948, this is a uh, protocol of a meeting, uh, Golda Meir, uh, making sure that they will not go back to Acre or Nazareth. They should not go back to these uh, places. Uh, destruction of the villages uh, in during the military operation to stop to stop the Arabs going back, prevention and the cultivation of the land, settlement of Jews in these villages, uh, and legislation and uh, propaganda uh, on this. Uh, the military assault you can see here. This is from a British intelligence officer. Uh, again talking about during the morning, the Jews were continually shooting down all the Arabs who moved uh, in the old city of Wadi uh, Nis Nisna, Nisnas. They included completely indiscriminate uh, machine gun, fire, mortar, sniping women and children. This is what took place. This is how Palestine was occupied. And they tell you Palestinians sold their land. You know, this is the second propaganda. The first propaganda is that there's a land without a people for a people without a land. And then when there is people in the land, then these people actually sold this the land. So, and you hear lots of Muslims repeating this Zionist propaganda across the world. You can see how new identities, new countries were now being created. And this is uh, an image I took myself from the British archive uh, in London. And you can see uh, here, how they initially in 1916 initially drew the lines then deleted them no put the line here and then eventually we come to a map like this dividing the land and this was meant to be the uh, uh, the uh, international zone and when the british occupied they did not keep their word uh, this is also another letter from the uh, british archive uh, the meeting between Faisal and Hayim Wiseman, and he talks about amazingly how he was honored to meet him and to uh, uh, offer him hospitality and so on and so forth. And you can see it also in the letter uh, from them. This starting from 1917 with the British occupation and the proclamation of the war, the revolutions that took place, we talked about the uh, renovations in the Masjid al-Aqsa, which Sheikh Hasidin Qassam was against. And uh, uh, just to uh, wrap up the discussion here, how uh, he was against this, use this money instead of beautifying the mosque, use it to buy weapons to fight the occupation. The Barak uprising, the Barak uprising at the end of it, uh, a document was offered that was uh, the condition was that no British should be in this uh, uh, in this 
in this commission. And the commission uh, was, I'm trying to find the book, uh, it's in the library here. The commission came to the conclusion that uh, Palestine is, uh, sorry, Al Burak Wall is solely, the Western Wall of Al Masjid Al Aqsa is solely a Muslim walk property, and Jews have no right in it whatsoever. And it was uh, uh, accepted by the League of Nations. So today, the uh, wall of the wall of the Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Barak Wall, is, according to international law, is an Islamic property, an Islamic wall. Jews have no right at it whatsoever. Uh, the killing uh, during this revolution uh, of someone like the three famous men, uh, Jamju, Fuad Hijazi, and Atazir, uh, and their last words is that the Muslims uh, across the whole world needs to uh, uh, fight the, the occupation and know that the British are like uh, foxes. They uh, do not trust them. And the same was said by Hazrat Qassam. He said, whoever tries what has been tried, meaning negotiation uh, with the occupiers, is a khain. And whoever tries uh, to do this, his mind is messed up. 1948, you see the exodus of Palestinians, the Nakba, uh, the ethnic cleansing. And you can see people running away with whatever they can gather and taking their keys. And they lived in refugee camps, just like Syrians are living in refugee camps. And then turning these camps into houses, into uh, makeshift filth, uh, shelters for people to uh, live in. Uh, this is the uh, how Palestine, British Palestine, looked in 1946. You can see still the mainly Arab population across the whole of it, and you can see the UN partition plan uh, unfair, giving 55% of the land to the Zionists, uh, and then you can see in 1948 they occupied. Uh, 78% of the land, and what was left was only 22% the West Bank and Gaza, and that was occupied in 1967. And today, these are the places where Palestinians are uh, in, in green, and the rest, unfortunately, has been turned into uh, Israel. Uh, in 1967, now coming to 1967, uh, and we're running out of time. 1967, you can see here. Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Al Burak Wall here, and this is the Mar Maghrib Quarter, the Moroccan, the North African Quarter, which was from the time of the Ayyubids after Salah al Din has become an Islamic walk property with madrasas, with houses, and so on. The first thing that the Zionists did when they occupied Beit al Maqdis is to put their hand on Al Burak Wall uh, and uh, immediately after they did that, they destroyed the Maghrib quarter to make way for Jewish uh, worship at Al Burak Wall, and this was the first uh, violation of the status uh, quo. Uh, what uh, Ben Gurion has said, and this is important for today's content uh, to understand today, is he talks about. Uh, and he's secular. This is a secular issue. He says there is no meaning to Israel without Jerusalem, and there is no meaning to Jerusalem without the temple. So the temple is used as something that they would like to push forward, that the temple is going to come down from the sky. And this is a difference between uh, Christian Zionists and Jewish Zionists and different types of Jewish Zionists uh, today. And what is happening this week in Al Masjid Al Aqsa is. Uh, is 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 very very problematic. Uh, so there is a lot that we need to bear in mind uh, uh, on this uh, on this uh, issue. Um, coming back to the occupation in 1967, 1967 on the seventh of June, the Israeli flag was raised over the Dome of the Rock. Uh, they celebrated the occupation. The Muslims fought uh, in 1948, and they also fought after that in 1967. And the uh, minaret, uh, a spot minaret of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, was heavily damaged because 
many of the Muslim fighters were still fighting, uh, stopped trying to stop the Zionists from entering in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Eventually they entered, they raised the, the Zionist flag over the Dome of the Rock. The military chaplain, and soon to be the chief rabbi, suggested that Al-Aqsa's Dome of the Rock should be destroyed with 100 kilograms of explosive TNT. Uh, and he said this to the generals, and the generals said they would not uh, do this. Uh, and the reasons that they would not do this, uh, I'm sure you can guess, uh, this would raise the whole of the Muslim world against them. But they went in with their uh, armed vehicles inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa, Moshe Dayan comes in and immediately uh, agrees with the Jordanian Awqaf that these are pictures coming from Masjid Al-Aqsa and we see similar pictures today. You can see uh, what happened in the Masjid Al-Aqsa over the last few weeks. People dressed inappropriately uh, inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, what Moshe Dayan does is he... Uh, announces that inside the Masjid al-Aqsa will be run by the Jordanian Al-Qaf. They, most of these people are secular. You see the religious uh, rabbi, he wanted to change this, destroy it and build the temple immediately. Uh, they said, no, this is, so he issues the protection of holy places law in 1967, uh, in accordance, uh, accordingly, that inside uh, uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa will be ruled by the uh, Waqf and the gates from outside and the entrance will be decided by the Israeli occupation forces. And al Barak wall is lost, the gate of Magariba, the key will stay with them. And the chief rabbi at that time said that uh, entry to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is actually forbidden according to the Torah this is the fatwa uh, that the rabbi, the chief rabbi at that time issued, and the fatwa still is today, that Jews are actually, according to the Torah, are not allowed to enter Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa until the building of the temple. Uh, so this is today a sign placed at the gate, the Magariba gate of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. However, this sign has been recently uh, removed, we talked about the destruction of the Magariba quarter, completely wiped out, immediate confiscation of al Barak wall, and you can see turning it into uh, a place for uh, their visitation uh, into the Masjid al-Aqsa Mubarak. Now we see two different lines going forward. The Christian Zionists are adamant that, and there was an, uh, a Christian uh, prophecy from the United States saying that within four years uh, of 1967, uh, the uh, temple is going to be built. This is by Christian Zionists. So this pushed someone, uh, his name, and our first class was on the day uh, of the anniversary of the building, uh, the burning of the Masjid al-Aqsa in 1969, a Christian Zionist by the name of Michael Dennis Rowan, uh, Australian, comes and burns in Masjid al-Aqsa with the help of uh, other uh, Zionist Jews, and uh, it burns the iconic gift of Nur al-Din Zinki, which stayed in Masjid al-Aqsa for 771 years. It burns it and makes major damage to the southern building of Masjid al-Aqsa, a third of which was uh, destroyed. So you can see here an important point that Christian Zionists would want to force the hand of God that we need to build a temple for the return of Jesus Christ. Jewish Zionists were, although we have the rabbi who suggested that, the majority of them believe that the temple is going to come down by divine decree. Now, in the last few decades, there are Jewish Zionists, religious Jewish Zionists, pushing this idea that we need to build a temple. And they've organized everything in that. Uh, underneath Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, we have the tunnels uh, that are uh, 
weak thing, the foundation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. In 1990, there is lots of events that took place, but I'm running through them very quickly to come to the modern uh, period. The massacre inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, where tens of Muslims were uh, killed in order to make access to the temple groups. Uh, to put the foundation stone inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. So Al-Aqsa is always at the focal of everything. The opening of the tunnel in 1996 uh, also instigated another uprising. Uh, Ariel Sharon entering the Masjid Al-Aqsa in 2000 instigated the second intifada, uh, where many Muslims were also uh, massacred. Now what we have is a temporal uh, division of the Masjid. Uh, uh, Jews enter in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Unfortunately, now it is even gone beyond what used to happen before. Uh, mornings and afternoons are for Jews and uh, sometimes for the Muslim. Muslims are being harassed. And you can see in this image, this soldier attacking these three elderly women just outside the gate of Al Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, a woman, uh, her hijab is being pulled off at the gate of the Masjid Al-Aqsa, Muslims are not allowed to enter while Zionist uh, settlers are allowed to enter. But they were allowed to enter and they're not allowed to conduct prayer. And if any of them would conduct prayer, they would be forced out of the Masjid Al-Aqsa immediately. But now uh, this is changing, particularly after the deal of the century. From 1967 till today, there has not been a single day without Zionists entering the Masjid Al-Aqsa. And you can see people like uh, uh, sister Aida here, uh, Aida Sidawi, who was attacked viciously uh, last year by settlers uh, with pepper spray. They uh, tore her jilbab and uh, attacked her. Uh, she stands together with other uh, Morabitat against the occupiers uh, to try. They are not allowed to enter in Masjid Al Aqsa. Uh, and the settlers are inside, so they pray to the closest point outside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. And you can see the Zionists going through the Mabariba gate. And now they would like to change this and to enter from different gates of the Masjid Al-Aqsa. But you can see armed soldiers, if this would happen anywhere else in the world, armed soldiers in one of Islam's holiest places, and they would use uh, tear gas, they would use rubber bullets, they would use uh, live ammunition, they would use everything inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. And there's a story that I've witnessed in my eyes eight years ago in the Masjid Al-Aqsa that made me feel that this Ummah does not exist. This Ummah, uh, when a Muslim woman is attacked inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa while reading the Quran by a Zionist soldier, he would bite her with his teeth like a vicious dog and allowed to stand there and laugh at the Muslims while they uh, try to defend her and unable to do anything. Uh, with thousands of soldiers inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis is something that uh, you can see in this picture tells a lot. Uh, tens of soldiers trying to uh, arrest one single Muslim woman. Uh, and this does not just happen to Muslim holy sites, also to Christian holy places. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest place to Christians, was uh, closed uh, by because of the Zionist action. Uh, also attacks on churches, you can see trying to burn churches. Uh, you can see in the image here on the right. And when the Pope came and he came to this separation wall, what Israel is trying to do inside the Masjid al-Aqsa is uh, apply what they have achieved inside the Mosque of Ibrahim, uh, uh, Prophet Ibrahim in Al-Masjid al-Ibrahimi in Al-Khalil, my city in, in Hebron. Uh, when uh, a Zionist uh, fanatic uh, settler, uh, Jewish settler in 1994 comes inside the Masjid al-Ibrahimi uh, during the month of Ramadan, if you recall, uh, it was February, this man comes, shoots people in the month of Ramadan, in the Fajr prayer, while they are fasting, while they are in their sujood, he shoots them from their backs and kills tens of people. And Masjid al-Ibrahim was closed for six months, and when it was reopened, 
60% of the mosque was turned into a synagogue. Muslims do not have access to that. And this is what the discussion in the uh, Israeli uh, Knesset, their parliament, took place is to apply the same thing inside the Masjid al-Aqsa, where parts of the Masjid al-Aqsa would be dedicated for Jewish prayer uh, and uh, parts will be for Muslims. So besides the division in time to divide the mosque by space, where a site of inside the Masjid al-Aqsa, particularly around the, there was many attempts. Well, the first attempt was to take the Marwani basement and this failed because of Sheikh al Salah and the others who opened this for Muslim prayer because since 1967 it was closed. So they opened it and the Al Aqsa Al Qadim, the old basement underneath the Jama Al Aqsa, was also reopened for Muslim worship. Now they started looking at the area of Babur Rahma. And just two days ago, you saw a uh, Yehudi Greek rabbi blowing the shofar in over the, uh, the graves of the Sahaba just outside the Masjid al-Aqsa, here uh, where two of the great Sahaba of the Prophet are uh, buried. Attack are not just on the living, but also on the dead. And you see, you saw images of the woman trying to uh, stop the destruction of her son's grave. Uh, even the dead are not safe. Uh, from this. But now, more dangerous than all of what I've discussed in the terms of the occupation of the land, that can all be reversed, but the occupation of the mind is more dangerous. And uh, what we have today are Muslim Zionists, or Arab, sorry, we can't say Muslim uh, Zionists, because a Muslim cannot be a Zionist. Uh, and at the same time, by the way, a Muslim cannot be an anti-Semitic. Uh, a Muslim is anti-Zionist. However, today we have uh, Turkish, Arab, and other uh, Pakistani and other uh, quote-unquote Muslim Zionists who are promoting the Zionist propaganda. So from, the, if you recall, 1948 war, uh, behind the army, there was another brigade uh, following the army, and this was documented by uh, an Israeli academic who wrote a book on stealing uh, books, and it was his PhD thesis. Uh, and what happened is, following the army, uh, there was a brigade, an armed brigade, that would go into the Palestinian cities and villages and steal the books. Most of the Israeli National Library books have been stolen from Palestinian homes. So, and this was not just to steal the books and to enrich the library, but it was to create a new narrative, the Zionist narrative on the history. And this is unfortunately until today, the most popular narrative across the world that the Zionists have pushed this narrative forward. And this narrative is what uh, most people unfortunately subscribe to. You go to universities from Malaysia all the way to South Africa and other places, uh, and even the West, uh, you'll find that most of the sources are giving the Zionist narrative uh, on the occupation or what they call the independence of uh, the state of uh, Israel. But this takes a new dimension, and I will give you two examples. The first is this man you see on the top. His name is Professor Mordechai Kidar. Uh, a Zionist uh, academic who regularly appears on Al Jazeera TV, unfortunately. Uh, so this man uh, made a video, uh, you can find it online in Arabic, he speaks Arabic, uh, and he says, uh, the reason uh, Al, Al Quds is never mentioned in the Quran, number one. Number two, uh, the importance of Jerusalem to Muslims is only a political importance during the Umayyad because of the fighting between Abdul Malik and Abdullah ibn Zubair, and the building of the Dome of the Rock happened because of that. So he blows all of this up. He misquotes people like Al Waqid and he says the Prophet never came to Masjid al Aqsa in Palestine. He actually went to Jairana next to Mecca uh, on the way to Ta'if, and he puts this claim forward. This, okay, you might say most Muslims would not accept this. They would not accept this from a Zionist. But, 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 and listen to this. The man on the left 
bottom left hand side, Yusuf Zidan, is an Arabic, an Arab Zionist. He's an Egyptian, a very famous author, and he has been instructed, as has been leaked in uh, uh, a tape, and you find it on YouTube. Uh, he was ordered by the uh, current president uh, of Egypt, Sisi, to undermine the importance of Al Masjid Al Aqsa in Palestine to Egyptians. So he comes on national TV and he says, Exactly, he quotes more the Haikadar without quoting him directly, but he says exactly the same argument without even adding anything into the argument, without double checking the argument, without anything. So he comes on TV and he says, Al Aqsa is not in Palestine, Al Aqsa is in next to Mecca, Al Aqsa is this, uh, uh, it's not. And then he starts attacking figures like Salah al Din to try to undermine these important figures in the Muslim uh, mind. This is one example. The second example is by um, one of the ex-president, uh, prime ministers of Israel, Yehud Olmert, when he was the mayor of the uh, municipality of Jerusalem. Uh, during his time, he took most of the research done by Zionist Israeli scholars, and he translates it into Arabic, which undermines the importance of Al-Aqsa. And he puts in that argument that he translates it and gives it free of charge to the people in the city. The reason for doing this is to try to undermine the importance of Al Masjid Al Aqsa in the minds of those who are defending Al Masjid Al Aqsa in the city. And this is the most dangerous thing: is to try to rewrite history and to rewrite the importance of this place in the uh, Muslim uh, in the Muslim uh, mind. So this is extremely uh, difficult. Uh, of what has happened uh, in the uh, in 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 the uh, mind uh, of people uh, today, and we can see this uh, apartheid state and how it is functioning, similar to what has happened in South uh, Africa. The dangers in Mr. Aqsa face, and this is uh, the end that we will try to come to. Uh, is uh, the idea that a temple needs to be built on the site of the Masjid al-Aqsa. And there are many different ideas that are being presented. There's uh, different, uh, as uh, one uh, academic says, if you ask 100 uh, archaeologists and, or biblical scholars on the site of the temple, you'll get 101 answers. They do not know what the temple was or where it was. And most of this is based on... Uh, the uh, rewritten uh, Torah that was rewritten during in the Babylon period, but there is lots of problems with that, and let's not get into that. And the foundations of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, you saw falling of foundation stones, uh, ancient stones in the basement of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. There's cracks in the walls, there's a tree that just fell just a few days ago, but the worst thing that has happened to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is the occupation. And you saw the resilience of the Palestinians against this occupation. Uh, every day they are paying with their blood and sweat at the gates of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, and you saw in 2017 when Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa was sealed for two full weeks, the people there uh, came to the closest point in their tens of thousands until Israel removed these barriers and reopened Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa without any conditions. Uh, you, you saw. But this does not mean that this is the end. The Prophet ﷺ has told us that the future is Al-Aqsa is not just going to be liberated, but Al-Aqsa will become the center of the future Khilafah of Islam, which we have discussed a few times. And this is a beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says, the prophethood shall be with you as long as Allah wills it to be, then Allah will lift it whenever he wishes. Then it will be a khilafah on the way of the prophethood. And Allah will let it last as long as Allah wishes. And then Allah will lift it when he wishes to lift it. Then it will be mulkan aadban from father to son, which happened from the time of uh, the companion Muawiyah all the way till the end of the uh, Ottoman period. And the period before that was from Abu Bakr to uh, al Hassan, and after that we, we see from father to son, then Allah will lift it whenever he wishes to lift it, and this has ended. Then he says, then it shall be 
Mulkan Jabriyan, you shall be ruled by force. And Allah will let this continue as long as He wishes. Then Allah will lift it whenever He wishes to lift it. And this is what we are living through today. So we've seen the prophethood, we've seen the Khilafah Rashida, we've seen the uh, Sultanate from father to son, and then we have seen the to be ruled uh, by uh, rulers that people do not want. And now, uh, next stage, the Prophet says, Then it shall return to a Khilafah on the way of the prophethood, and then the Prophet was silent. What we see uh, is uh, the Muslims are shying away from talking about these things, but then we see the Zionists, the Christian Zionists, and Jewish Zionists are not shying away. And we see what we ha what happened in uh, the deal of the century, which is very dangerous on the Masjid al-Aqsa, but when uh, Donald Trump talked about uh, Jerusalem, united Jerusalem shall be the eternal capital, not of Israel, but of the Jewish people. He's setting the mark so high. And then when the Muslim leaders met in Istanbul, and only 14 out of 56 of them actually turned up, some of them sent their driver or their secretary or whoever they sent, pathetic. And then the outcome of this meeting is that Eastern Jerusalem shall be the future capital of a future Palestine. You see where they're heading, uh, Donald Trump and the Zionists are hit, uh, setting the bar and we are so far down in the response and, and unfortunately and what we see with trump's policy on uh, on this what he has uh, decided uh, on the uh, creation of uh, moving the embassy and then uh, on the issue of the masjid al-aqsa is extremely uh, dangerous this is the work of one of my uh, students who is writing her thesis on this uh, subject. Uh, but uh, after moving the embassy, which we talked about, one of the things that was being discussed uh, in this is that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa shall be open to followers of all religion for worship. This is extremely dangerous for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, that it will be open for them during their uh, uh, times of worship, and they shall uh, conduct uh, their uh, prayers. This is uh, moving towards something different, which is the um, not just the uh, temporal division by time, but spatial division of the Masjid al-Aqsa, that during Jewish holidays, this is also the policy that uh, is being followed by, uh, and, uh, by Biden. But before that, what you saw with, uh, with what was happening under Donald Trump, this gave the Zionists a push towards pushing this. Before this deal of the century, Jewish prayer in the Masjid al-Aqsa was unaccepted, silent prayer may be uh, possible, but now loud prayers and what al-Aqsa is going to face over the next two weeks is extremely dangerous. It will set a new mark for what will happen inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, Al-Mubarak in preparation for the building of a Zionist temple over the site of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. Extremely dangerous days that the masjid Al-Aqsa is going through. And if this Ummah does not work together, then we are in a very, very difficult position. The uh, defending Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is not the role of the Palestinians. It is the role of all the Muslims. And it is the uh, role to defend the Masjid al-Aqsa in every uh, possible, uh, in every possible uh, way, uh, inshallah. Uh, I don't want to end with a negative note because the people inside the Masjid al-Aqsa are fighting with everything that they are doing. Uh, but let's take your questions. Uh, please, if you have written your questions before, please write them again. Uh, copy and paste your questions. Uh, these uh, other, uh, I have, uh, some of you were asking me about this yesterday, but uh, yesterday I, uh, sorry, on Friday, I received these uh, other branches from Al Masjid Al Aqsa. My sister was there. And also, uh, uh, we had uh, a group of uh, students. Uh, they finished a course uh, on. 
uh, writing stories for uh, um, children on Al Masjid Al Aqsa. So, 20 of them, they, they just finished this. And this was their gift uh, a pen uh, together with, uh, with the concept of resistance. Uh, so, you can see uh, this. Um, this uh, as as something that we can uh, continue uh, continue on, inshallah. Okay, so let's uh, see the questions and uh, Bismillah. Uh, what is the first question that we can start with? The first question is regarding Sultan Abdul Hamid. Um, the letter that why he was dethroned. Uh, let's see if I can get the actual uh, letter. Uh, so I can share it with you and you can uh, also uh, see it. Uh, the letter he says clearly in the letter uh, that the reason that he was dethroned is the uh, is the uh, not giving a bait and not this as uh, a land for the uh, for for uh, for for the uh, Jews. Um, uh, it's not opening up. My apologies. If I get it, then I will uh, share it with you. Let's move to the uh, second question. One one more try. I'll have a look. Uh, hopefully, I can find it in this slide. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Okay, um, you can find it in online, or you, there are some uh, published uh, articles that discuss uh, this, uh, or in the uh, lectures from last uh, last uh, step by step beta this which we discussed the issue in more more. more uh, okay. Is uh, question one. Uh, there is no reliable organization that we can for the future. How can we proceed from there? Uh, there is good in this ummah. The Prophet وسلم, said, Al wa fi ummati ila There is good in my ummah until the day of judgment. So do not despair. Do not think that it is not possible to uh, achieve what we want to achieve. What we need to get to is get away from divisions. We learn from the example of uh, many people didn't trust, by the way, Salah had been until he liberated Bayt al -Maqdis. So don't think that even during that time things were rosy and beautiful. Uh, it took uh, a long, a long time before things actually uh, bought, uh, managed to uh, bear uh, fruits. So uh, we need to continue uh, learning from the examples, try to unite ourselves behind this direction. We can learn this clearly from Salah Abdin and what he has managed to uh, achieve through uh, this particular uh, uh, issue. I found the letter. Uh, let me share it with you so you can uh, see it. Uh, let's make it a bit bigger. Uh, and you can see here in the text uh, that you see here on the left hand side written uh, by Sultan Abdul Hamid, in which he starts with Alhamdulillah and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, how he was dethroned. And he talks about the Khilafah al Islamiyah uh, and he talks about the John Turks, the Young Turks, and what they were trying to do. And then he talks here clearly. That Aradi Muqaddasa, the Philistine, there, uh, the Holy Land, and Palestine, he would not give as Uyghun bi Watan Qawmit the Sisina Kabul wa Tasdik Etmek Uyghun Israela. He did not give it to be a land for uh, a, a homeland, uh, a reasonable homeland for the uh, Jews. So this letter clearly uh, uh, says uh, say the, says that in the writing of Sultan Abdul Hamid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his uh, soul. Okay, let's continue with the questions. Uh, um, 
are Zionist, Jewish Zionists uh, looking towards Christian Zionists for building the temple? No, now Jewish Zionists have evolved. Still, the majority of Jews are waiting for the temple to come down from the sky. So they believe God is going to create, uh, to bring down the temple. However, these reformist Zionists, and there are now a lot of organizations, and they're the ones pushing for intrusions into al Masjid al-Aqsa, and they're the ones now, they've prepared the stones, the clothes, the, even there's a red heifer, uh, a cow, everything is ready for the building of the uh, uh, temples. Is there memoirs of Sultan Abdul Hamid we can read in English? Actually, his daughter has written uh, memoirs, so you can uh, relate to that. Uh, would you kindly mention Abdul Aziz or Rantisi? Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, he was uh, one of the Palestinian resistance leaders who fought against the Zionists, and he said something uh, he fought against the Zionists, he was expelled to southern Lebanon, returned to Palestine, continued their resistance, and he says, as a doctor, either uh, I have, I see people die every day, and either you can die on your bed, on hospital bed, or you can die uh, by an Israeli weapon, and I prefer to be, uh, to become a martyr by the Israeli Apache. Uh, yes, uh, the slingshots with a twist uh, it's also a pen uh, so it's uh, both uh, together uh, you mentioned that Al-Aqsa was divided a synagogue and a masjid did you say uh, today parts of it, underneath the uh, uh, western tunnel of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa there is a synagogue but they would like to have large section a third of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa turned into a synagogue uh, but still they haven't succeeded uh, in doing that, and if the Muslims stay silent, then this would become a reality like it became a reality in the Mosque of Abraham, which was closed uh, last, uh, we discussed it also a few weeks back, uh, during Friday prayers, it was sealed off for Muslims because it, it coincided with uh, Jewish holidays. Rabia, those countries that have resumed ties with Israel, uh, a disaster, but uh, at the same time, including anyone who normalizes relation with Israel, this is a blow to the issue of al-Masjid al-Aqsa and to Palestine and to Palestinians and to Jerusalemites. This, there is no excuse. Whoever does it, whether he's Arab, whether he's Turk, whoever does that, this is completely unacceptable and is uh, an attack on, uh, on that. And this is how the uh, people around al-Masjid al-Aqsa see it. And Rasulullah told us, a hadith that لا تزال طائفة طائفة من أمتي على الحق. There is a group of my ummah always on the right, uh, and they, uh, they are always uh, fighting. Uh, they will overcome their enemy until the, the fate of Allah will come, and they shall always be patient. They said, Ya Rasulullah, where are they? He said, In Bayt al Maqdis and around Bayt al Maqdis. So the people in the region of the Holy Land, the people around it in Gaza, in Syria, and Egypt. Uh, and particularly the people around Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, see where you are from them. If you, if they are on the right path, the Rasulullah has said. So if they tell you this is wrong and they say normalizing with the Zionists is, uh, it does not gain you anything. And what uh, United Arab Emirates, what Sudan, what uh, Morocco, what uh, Saudi is about to do, what Egypt and Jordan and Turkey are doing is completely unacceptable in this regard. And uh, Indonesia is down the line and other Arab countries uh, and other Muslim countries are also unfortunately going through this. But however, bear in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ Until Allah separates good from bad. And sometimes you might think that this is not good, but this is uh, something uh, uh, very, very dangerous. Fatima, who was the queen of Arabia, uh, the queen of the desert, uh, was Gertrude Bell. You can uh, see the film about her, but the film is Hollywood. It is it's presenting her in a good light. But uh, uh, read about her, read her memoirs, uh, read what this woman, this woman uh, set uh, Churchill, 
when he was about to draw the lines uh, of many of the states like northern Iraq, he said no one touches their pens until Gertrude comes. She was an expert in the region. She sat with all the tribal leaders. Uh, she went across and she uh, is one of the reasons why there is no uh, Kurdistan today is because she was against the Kurds having a state uh, for particular reasons that's not the place to uh, discuss. What is being done to the rest of control? Uh, can you please repeat the question, Bob? Uh, it's not clear. Uh, Banu, I cannot see, I cannot go back further. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, the current plan, vision strategy to free Palestine. Unfortunately, there is no plan amongst the Muslims to do this. And even the Islamic resistance movement, uh, Hamas, uh, its leader Khalid Mush'al a while back made a comment uh, that there is really no strategy for this and unfortunately that's very sad um, and if we follow a strategy based on the prophetic roadmap and Salah al-Din how he liberated there's a lot we can learn knowledge is the starting uh, point that we need to uh, take uh, forward uh, political, economic, military pressures like the West NATO. Uh, no, unfortunately, Arab countries are not going to do this. Arab countries are exactly doing the opposite. They're instead of putting pressure on Israel, they're normalizing with Israel. So do not expect anything from governments. The only thing that can change is movement from the ground, from the people on the ground. And, and this is you. These are the people like what happened in South Africa. The world was against apartheid. The people boycotted. The people did everything. We talked about a plan. Each one has to have a road plan. Do not belittle yourself. Every little helps. Uh, every little that you do will eventually lead to this. And we talked about uh, education being the basis for all of this. And we talked about spiritual, religious, political connection, plus uh, economic plus also the gift. And there is a lot more we can learn from the example of Salah Adin on the unity of the Muslims. But individual action does not pay off. This needs to become a, a, a massive uh, movement in the Muslim world uh, towards the Masjid al-Aqsa. Then things will start to change. Um, that being kept up. Uh, please put the question again. Uh, more on the Islamic educational system. That's a long discussion. Uh, um, and we're running out of time in our last lecture. My apologies. There's, uh, hopefully we can have more discussions on this, if you like, uh, in the full uh, one-year uh, program. Uh, uh, name any Zionist from Pakistan. I cannot think of uh, a name just now, uh, but what I was talking about, Arab Zionists, we have, uh, I mentioned to Yusuf Zidan in Saudi Arabia, in a Qad newspaper, uh, the same argument was published on Kuwaiti National, uh, on Kuwaiti Watan TV, the same was being said uh, in Turkey, and, uh, and I hope Pakistan uh, on this issue stays uh, strong and we do not have uh, at least they, they are not uh, visible. Can those countries who have started relation uh, for the violence that Palestinians have to suffer daily? You saw actually just two, day, two days ago, yesterday, the day before, uh, these Arab countries that are normalizing, like Morocco and the United Arab Emirates, were present at an Israeli military show, showing how they would attack a Palestinian. So. Uh, they, they're not going to uh, speak with Israel about stopping violence, although some claim that they are doing this, uh, but this is not something that uh, possible. Yes, uh, Bob uh, Burhanuddin, um, Dua is number one in our roadmap that we have agreed uh, on. I have found many of our leaders being negative for the proposal of the establishment of Khilafah, asking the reason they, uh, the, the concept of Khilafah has become a dogma amongst the Muslims. Uh, Muslims have Islamophobia. Muslims have Islamophobia. This is how bad the Muslims have become. 
uh, Muslims fear the concept of jihad, fear the concept of Sharia, fear the concept of Khilafah, fear the concept. These are Islamic concepts ingrained in the heart of Islam. Uh, and you see actually in all uh, juristical uh, books that Khilafah is an essential part. And uh, when Abu Bakr Siddiq, when the Prophet Sallallahu died, even before burying the Prophet Sallallahu immediately establishing Khalif was important. But Khilafah has also been discolored by uh, uh, groups like Daesh, ISIS, and others who have portrayed, gave, gave, gave uh, unfortunately, a concept of Khilafah that fits in with that uh, stereotype. I once watched on Jewish TV writer claiming that the last target, Moses, was not Palestine. He was claiming Mecca, the center. Have you ever heard of this? There are some claims that uh, the Holy Land is not in Palestine, but these are generally uh, not accepted, uh, even Islamically, or even an Arab nationalist uh, tried to push this idea uh, forward. Some of them argue this, but it's not, uh, it's not the general uh, accepted understanding. Um, oh, mashallah, we have lots of questions, and I want to wrap up in 10 minutes. So let me try to run as much as we can. I live in London, but want to do an accreditation course with possible organized visits to Al-Aqsa. Can you recommend course online uh, if you know any university in London? Uh, we have... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mazdin, for bringing this up. Actually, let me bring up the program that we will be running uh, on Dayton Maqdis. Uh, let me see if I'm able to share the screen with you. Um, I need to connect here and then try. Just give me one second. Uh, my apologies. Uh, uh, going uh, to be run uh, uh, with Allahumma um, uh, Salah Sayyidina Muhammad uh, in association with the University, Social Sciences University of Ankara. It's going to be uh, uh, a course that is going to be running. In September next year. The course is um, aimed at establishing following up where we have left off here. So uh, the idea of this course is going to be uh, uh, developing on where we have uh, stopped and how we can continue uh, from there. Um, um, I hope you are able to see my screen. Uh, or not yet. Uh, give me one second to share the screen. Uh, so the details of the course I will uh, share with you. You'll find the information on isra.org.uk in a few days. Uh, this will be announced. Uh, so you can see uh, here uh, the Certificate in Islamic Jerusalem Studies. Uh, it will be given by a number of uh, scholars over one year period. Uh, there will be uh, five courses, Way to Maqdis in the Quran and Hadith, Way to Maqdis between occupation and liberation, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the place and significance, the current occupation of Way to Maqdis, and a project each one will do. These are some of the lectures that will be teaching from uh, Malaysia, from Palestine, from uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa, from Turkey, from Qatar and other uh, places, uh, the classes. Each semester, there will be two courses uh, that will uh, run, uh, and uh, the details and the payments and the dates and so on, you will find uh, on uh, this uh, website, and you can make your application uh, through, uh, through that. Uh, this, I uh, have just seen the uh, details of it, but you will see, you can access it through isra.org.uk from uh, next week. The details will be shared on that uh, site, in, in, inshallah. Okay, 
uh, back to the questions. How far did we go? Uh, please elaborate. I have found many of our leaders being negative. We've answered that. Uh, yes, we just went through this. So there uh, is also a master program uh, in English at the University of Social Sciences, University of Ankara. And there's also a master's and PhD in UUM in Malaysia, uh, University of Tara Malaysia, and a new center uh, also in Arabic and in Turkish in Mardin University. And uh, these are the places in the world where Baking Makta Studies is being offered at the moment. A new center has just been opened in Indonesia and maybe another one also in Malaysia. Uh, thank you, Fahima. Uh, before the Ottoman collapse, there was not clear. Yes, 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 uh, that's true. There was, uh, these boundaries were not in that same form. Actually, what existed at the end of the Ottoman uh, period uh, was a different administrative division. And the administrative divisions change with time. And what we saw at the end of the Ottoman period and we see maps of this, there was what was known as Qudus uh, Sharif Mutasarif. So this was a province, uh, the independent province of Qudus uh, Sharif, that is directly linked to uh, Istanbul. So normally it would be linked to Damascus, uh, which will be a sub-province under it, but during the before Sultan Abdul Hamid, it was made into a province directly linked to the uh, 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 capital of the Khilafah. The reason why that happened is that it is connected directly. So these interventions of uh, and the penetration of the uh, Westerners would not take uh, place or to try to limit it as much as uh, possible. And there were some maps that we sh uh, have shown uh, showing uh, some of this and how this has actually uh, changed uh, with time and how this then becomes what it is uh, uh, during the British. And when the British drew the maps, actually they were to fit in with the biblical narrative, which is extremely important how they played with the, uh, to try to include parts in northern Palestine today, northern Palestine, they were part of Lebanon or Syria, they were re-included so that it fits with the biblical uh, boundaries from Dan to Beersheba, so they extended the boundaries to include that within uh, within uh, this particular uh, uh, region. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question. Uh, is there any mention of Jewish ideology in the Quran hadith a lot? The Quran talks about Bani Israel a lot. And the reason why the Quran talks about this is to make Muslims aware of this and to try not to make also the same uh, mistakes. Yes, uh, the, uh, this book, about Sultan Abdul Hamid actually has been uh, published a while back. And there's some recent, uh, even at the university I'm in and other places, there are studies on the time of Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid. In uh, uh, pushing the uprising, the role of Gaza is extremely important. As Rasulullah says, it is in Aknab Beit al Maqdis, and Gaza's role in the last war was extremely important in the protection of the Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, Gaza being involved uh, when the people in al Masjid al-Aqsa called upon the people of Gaza to support them, then they came and gave uh, the Israel an ultimatum to leave al Masjid al-Aqsa and to end the eviction of Palestinian homes in Sheikh Jarrah. And when this didn't take place, then the uh, people of Gaza put their lives on the line. Uh, how does the excavation take? Yes, the, from 1967, they've been digging underneath the Masjid al-Aqsa, and recently, just two, few days ago, a video has been released of the actual digging taking place underneath the Masjid al-Aqsa, and some of it actually does weaken the foundation of the Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, of what benefit is to the Western world still support your science? Uh, the state of Israel uh, is uh, an outpost of the Western uh, world. 
Uh, in order to control the region, they have a powerful uh, tool that they are using together with the uh, Arab leaders that fit perfectly with what they have uh, done. Uh, why can't get one Arab country at least to navigate sanctions against Israel because all of them have military might? They don't really have military might, uh, Syria. Uh, most of the weapons they get from the West uh, and uh, it is not something that they will be able to use against Israel in any way. And most of the Arab states are under the Western control and Donald Trump made it very clear. And he was very honest when he said, I called King Salman and I said two weeks uh, if we don't support you, you'll fall. Then he made it two days and then he made it two hours and he's laughing about it with his constituents. Uh, that's how pathetic the Arab leaders uh, are to be mocked in this way uh, and uh, very unfortunate. You mentioned in the beginning of the lecture that is there Arabic uh, to mock this step by step. Yes, Arabic uh, also uh, the diploma the one-year program has been running for 10 years in Arabic uh, and anyone would like to join that also through ISRA's website, all of it, all of which is going to be announced next week, inshallah. So uh, registration will end on the 17th of uh, October, uh, sorry, on the 7th of October. So uh, three weeks from now, uh, uh, one month from now, uh, teaching will start on this one-year program in English and in uh, in Arabic. Um, the sister has been... Yes, thank you. Uh, sister Fatima bin Ali has been doing excellent notes. I would like to thank her on your behalf. And uh, I'm sure that they will be shared again in the WhatsApp group and in the others. Thank you to Sister Fatima bin Ali for doing wonderful notes on the classes that we have uh, done. Was the territory of Palestine before it became British Palestine? It was named Quds Sharif, the independent province of Al Quds Sharif, and it used to be much bigger than Palestine today. It included Sinai, for example. Let me see if I can uh, find the map and show you the map of this, because this is quite important. I did a study uh, of the boundaries of uh, Beit al maqdis during the administrative boundaries of Beit al maqdis during the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid and I was quite impressed with the maps that were being designed and drawn out at that time. The western uh, side of the map that extended to uh, Egypt was something that Sultan Abdul Hamid was fighting against the British in extending these uh, uh, these uh, uh, maps uh, and extending the uh, land uh, in that uh, in that uh, direction. Uh, I'm not finding the map, but I'll uh, see if I manage to get it uh, while we are answering the questions. At the same time, I will uh, share it uh, with you, inshallah, so you are able to uh, see the map. Um, unfortunately, it's not coming up, but uh, in one of the first classes, we did uh, share it. Uh, yes, yes, and uh, Israeli newspapers, Nazir, have exposed many of secret meetings that have taken place between uh, MBS and the uh, Netanyahu and other Zionist leaders. And he's fearing a backlash of Saudis if he normalizes with Israel. So they're working on normalizing the uh, things on TV and in the uh, uh, public that supporting Palestinians is useless. We've supported them for such a long time. This is the current rhetoric on, on uh, Saudi uh, uh, TV, unfortunately. Yes, uh, if someone can help, uh, Farheen, if you please send me an email, we have a project which is one of the co-organizers of this uh, uh, group, of this series of lectures, Al Al Aqsa, which uh, is going to uh, launch uh, soon with animations and lots of information on Masjid Al Aqsa. And the Urdu translation has been done, but it needs to be checked by someone who is 
uh, grounded in Urdu and in Islamic studies. So if someone can help with this, that will be great. Or any other language, anyone who can help in any translating information on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to reach all the Muslims in all their languages, please send me an email. Uh, and the email was shown at the beginning of the uh, lecture. Uh, yes, unfortunately, Turkey is uh, changing its stance. It's normalizing relations with the Zionists. And you saw the welcome of the Zionist uh, president, uh, the welcome he got in Ankara. And uh, the people in Turkey were not happy with this, but uh, Turkey is trying to, uh, at the current state that it's in, is trying to cut back its problems with uh, its neighbors. And one of them is, uh, unfortunately, normalizing relations with uh, Israel. What should we do if all Muslims countries agree with normalization? Uh, you need to stand up and let your, your voice be heard. When the Zionist president came to Ankara, the people were not happy. The people uh, petitioned the government. The people spoke against it. The Israeli flags that were raised in the streets. People went up and took these flags down. Uh, do not, uh, Rasulullah says, uh, if you see wrong, then change it with your hand. If you cannot, then change it with your tongue. If you cannot, then change it with your heart. Uh, that is the weakest form of Iman. You should never accept this. Uh, what if the Zionist biggest fear threat today? What is uh, that? You, we saw with what happened in Kashmiri in at the time of Salah al-Din, the biggest fear of the Crusaders was a Muslim that would unite the two realms of Islam, uh, Cairo and Damascus. And uh, when uh, things were changing in Damascus and in uh, in um, Egypt, in Cairo, uh, the Zionists paid everything to make sure that this would not succeed. Just give me one second. The last one. It is getting dark. Uh, so their biggest fear is uh, Muslim unity uh, to fight the uh, Zionists. Uh, what other ways can they be weakened? Uh, you need to understand Jewish society. There, Allah says in the Quran very clearly, You think they're one, but their hearts are so divided. The Israeli society would collapse from inside. Uh, and they know how to make Muslim societies collapse from inside. But we don't have sufficient strategies to, uh, to work on this uh, issue. Or is it only through raising awareness? We need to do that amongst Muslims and we need to have strategies uh, uh, for working uh, with them. All of this is something that the Muslim woman needs to work together uh, on. <coughs> Bismillah. Yes, thank you very much, Fatima. But it is... Uh, uh, needs much more needs to be done from Pakistan uh, on the issue of the Masjid al-Aqsa to make it a local issue in Pakistan. That the Masjid al-Aqsa is not just an international issue, it's a local issue for people in, in, in Pakistan. Jazakumullah khair for the work that you do, Fatima, in Pakistan. Uh, may Allah give uh, the people in, uh, in South Africa, they have load shedding, which they uh, have uh, electrical black, uh, blackouts like in, in, in Gaza. It's the rulers who may support Zionism. Yes, the people will never do. And uh, it, uh, the Americans have been pushing Pakistani government to normalize with Israel. And I heard from a uh, Pakistani diplomat that this is not going to happen. Uh, but uh, you never know. Even Kuwait has been pressured to normalize with Israel. And Kuwait said, we will be the last country that will normalize. So the, eventually, they're all uh, inevitable that they're all going to do it. But uh, Allah knows that. Some exchange program where Muslims travel to Muslim countries, uh, that the issue of unity is a big thing that the Muslims need to. Salah al-Din did this by getting the Muslims to focus on one issue. Nur al -Din, uh, not Salah al-Din, starting with Nur al-Din. This is the issue that all Muslims can agree on. 
why uh, two movements will not dis disagree on this issue, make this the issue uh, that will be shareable. Uh, the details you will check on www.isra.org.uk from next uh, week, inshallah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, how can we connect to this course? Yes, please uh, go through the website that I mentioned and then we can, uh, that will be a start, inshallah, Zawajit. Um, yes, yes, there's a British man of Pakistani origin. Uh, we don't need to remember his name, uh, Mushtaq. Uh, he's a, he calls himself a Muslim Zionist and he supports the atrocities. He goes with the Israeli army and he, talks about uh, peace in, in Israel, uh, nonsense. Uh, you, you, you know uh, people like that, unfortunately, uh, it exist. Um, even media, yes, this is what your role is, education. We need to push this forward uh, with across the whole board. It is something that needs to be taught in madrasas this is something needs to be taught in schools in universities al-aqsa needs to be in every household uh, in across pakistan and across the muslim uh, the muslim uh, world jazakumullah khair it's a pleasure i'm checking uh, the details here if there's any question uh, there's a turkish historical drama yes uh, Yes, it is. Uh, it even discusses this Gertrude Bell, uh, and it does discuss these tricks that the British and the others have been uh, doing. Uh, the master program is not online. The master program is face to face, so it's available in Turkey, in Ankara, and in Mardin, and in Malaysia. Uh, the program in English is only, the taught program in English is only in Social Sciences University of Ankara uh, in uh, face, uh, face to face. The largest Muslim country uh, to spread knowledge. Uh, there is a lot that needs to be done <coughs> Excuse me. in Indonesia, in Pakistan in bangladesh these are the biggest muslim countries in india the biggest muslim countries in the world uh, and this is something that um, uh, education and getting different organizations to work together uh, there were many uh, training sessions that took place in indonesia uh this peace camp one and two with Sahabat al-Aqsa and other organizations uh, that have joined in and I was lucky to be part of that. Currently there has been a two-month tour of the founder of the field of Islamic Jerusalem Studies, Professor Abdul Fattah, in Malaysia. So he's traveling, uh, training the trainers on uh, Bayt uh, al-Muqdis. Jazakum uh, Allah khair, thank you for your kind words. Um, May Allah reward you all for uh, uh, for your kind words. I'll skip them. Uh, uh, most Javid, most of these Muslim countries are not uh, uh, interested. The rulers are being controlled by the West. Uh, so uh, these rulers are um, in 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 that position. What happened in the Arab Spring of trying to change these rulers, Israel saw as a threat to itself. So that's why they supported the anti-revolution uh, movement and brought people like uh, Sisi in Egypt with uh, Syria. Uh, the leaked uh, WikiLeaks showed that the United States is willing to keep Assad in his place until they get someone better who can serve Israel. Uh, so it's uh, uh, quite uh, quite uh, unfortunate uh, to do that. 
the uh, lecture notes, as far as I know, are available on the WhatsApp group. And also the link was shared on last week's lecture. So if you check the uh, and ask Sister Fatima to share them again after the lecture, check the comments. Hopefully you can see the comments uh, there, inshallah. Yes, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, uh, her uh, reign and her state is the, the one that established the Zionist state. And they've created lots of atrocities uh, as the British Empire across the, uh, the, the, the world, uh, unfortunately. Uh, maybe I'm reaching but Turkey stands changed very soon after foreign minister of you visited. Yes, uh, Turkey's position has changed uh, uh, a lot, uh, un unfortunately. I would be uh, honored to do any other program uh, with uh, any organization uh, in any of the countries. Uh, Alhamdulillah, recently I was in South Africa and we had two wonderful two weeks uh, across the country. Uh, talking about Beit al uh, may Allah reward the brothers, the ulama, uh, there for organizing that uh, wonderful uh, program. Uh, I'm trying to wrap up, but the questions keep coming in. Let me just share my email one more time, and then we will uh, bring this to a close, inshallah. Uh, Ta'ala. We've been running for two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, I thought we'll finish in half an hour the rest of the questions, but this is still uh, continuing. Uh, the email, uh, you can see it here. Uh, let me zoom in so you can see it uh, clearly, inshallah. Um, okay. I hope you are able to see the email. Uh, what can a Muslim do on his individual capacity? capacity? Uh, we talked about each one needs to prepare their own roadmap for the liberation of Beit al and it has to be individual. And we talked about five points. And please plan and have, uh, have this uh, organized and uh, do this as we have agreed. Thank you, uh, Mazbin Duha, uh, spiritually, educational, political boycott, and uh, prepare your gift for the liberation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Yes, time for the assignment uh, to talk about the assignment. The final assignment that you'll be requested to do is based on what we have learned so far. And uh, the details were meant to be sent to me and uh, so I can mention them to you. Um, the last time there was uh, things, other things that you needed to watch and to give comments on, comments uh, on, but we, this time I think we can stick with um, your roadmap for the liberation of Beit al -Makris. I think that uh, each one, about a page to two pages, your roadmap for the liberation, your personal roadmap for the liberation of Beit al is based on the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the example of Salah al -Din. How can you develop uh, in your uh, personal capacity, in your community, and in the wider circles that you are uh, around, uh, how you can do this? Let me repeat again. Uh, your personal roadmap for the liberation of Beit al maqdis is your final assignment based on what we have learned from. So you have to justify it based on the examples from the time of the Prophet, from the time of Salah al -Din, and from the context that we have discussed today. How can you put a roadmap, personal roadmap for yourself, for your family and for your wider community based on the examples that we have uh, 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 done. We've gone uh, down a few people, so let me finish here. Jazakumullah khair for attending these six lectures. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward you also abundantly for being part of this. 
uh, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some of you uh, uh, can continue on this um, on this uh, path, inshallah. Yes, the one-year diploma program in English and Arabic is online, and uh, we hope that many of you, this was a teaser uh, for that program. Um, so uh, please um, uh, take, if you are able to take this online course for one year, uh, two courses per semester, uh, so it means two lectures a year, uh, uh, sorry, two lectures a week uh, for uh, 12 weeks, uh, and you will learn more in-depth knowledge of what we have covered. What we've done in this course is we've run through the uh, history of Beit al uh, in uh, six weeks, and what it means is much more, a lot more, actually, and in the courses that we discussed, it's going to be discussing uh, more in detail for each of them. Uh, if you are able to join, that will be uh, great, inshallah, Zawjil. Um, <coughs> for the uh, assignments, you have one week from today. <coughs> and uh, I'm sure uh, Amr and uh, Ramza will uh, follow you up in the WhatsApp group. Uh, so one week from today, so today is the 18th of September, by the 25th of September to have submitted your uh, uh, assignment uh, by the 25th of September, inshallah, uh, Azza wa Jal. Uh, so 25th of September is the deadline for the assignment. The assignment is uh, for you uh, to, in one or two pages, uh, to discuss your personal roadmap uh, uh, for the liberation, the future, the third liberation of Beit al maqdis for the future liberation of Beit al maqdis based on uh, the example of the Prophet, the example of Salah al -Din, and the context in which we are living uh, today uh, for both uh, your community and the people uh, around you, inshallah. So, uh, the details for submitting will be sent on the WhatsApp group. Uh, uh, last time, things were sent by email. Uh, so I guess the, an email will be shared with you for you to be able to uh, submit that. Jazakumullah khair. We've covered, in, uh, as a conclusion, concluding remark. Jazakumullah khair. Your questions have been wonderful. Uh, your engagement has been incredible. Uh, in the last uh, six weeks, we have covered the history of Beit al-Maqdis over 10,000 years, the past, uh, the present, and uh, we touched briefly today on the future. The future is bright. The future is Beit al-Maqdis. The future of this Ummah starts from Beit al-Maqdis again. This Ummah received the flag of the leadership of humanity in Al-Masjid al-Aqsa during the night journey, and this Ummah will raise again uh, from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It is the thermometer of this Ummah and we need to bear in mind that Al-Aqsa is not a Palestinian issue. Al-Aqsa is your issue. It's a, an, an international issue of all Muslims, an international issue for all those who have a sense of humanity in their heart. Wherever you say injustice, Beit al maqdis is at the center of all of this. The rise of the Muslim Ummah starts again from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and it will be the second rise of this Ummah, inshallah. So, Jazakumullah khair for engaging uh, in the discussion and for your wonderful questions. And uh, my apologies if there's anything that we have uh, skipped or we didn't cover in detail, but this is where I invite you to join the uh, diploma, uh, one-year diploma program on uh, the uh, uh, Beit al maqdis the certificate in Beit al maqdis studies that will start in the mid of uh, October, but registration will end on the 7th of October. Details you will find on uh, www.isra.org.uk from next week, inshallah, in a few days time, the details of the diploma program you will find on this website. Jazakum Allah khair al jaza. Barakallah fikum. It's been an honor having people from across all continents joining this course. 
uh, and for you persisting to follow this. For those who have uh, joined us uh, late, they will have another uh, form to fill in uh, with questions from the lectures. If they get 60% um, uh, of the answers right, they will count as they have attended the lectures. But I, I recommend that you can go back to the lectures again and watch them and hopefully uh, learn something new. And if you would like to progress further, in this do the diploma course or do the master or phd in beta Mahdi studies we are in need for muslims across the world to take part in this educational endeavor uh, our motto is knowledge drives change freedom and the liberation of beta Maqdis. jazakumullah khair until we meet again inshallah in the liberated al masjid al aqsa al mubarak jazakumullah khair barakallah fikum Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.